Ja, guten Morgen, ganz herzlich willkommen zu unserem ersten Panel. Wir bleiben bei der Kontextualisierung und werfen uns in den globalen Kontext. And this is exactly the reason why this panel will be in English. I'm very happy to and very pleased with the presentations in this panel. We will be looking at the transformation uh, of expressionism uh, outside of, I guess, the German context uh, in a global context. Uh, and we actually have, as you have seen, uh, six presentations. So this is quite a large panel. Uh, and in this context, we have three papers which will be dealing with uh, reception and transformation of the expressionism in historical context, so speaking about the 1910 to 1930. And then we have three presentations who will be looking at post-war uh, and contemporary art practices and the responses to expressionism in this context. So basically, we will have two sets, and this panel anyhow will be a tour de force with six papers. So I decided that we basically do a set of three papers, take a short break, and then have another set of papers. So you can look forward to 11.10, I think, something like this. I'm really happy about uh, this conference, but particularly about this uh, panel, and that it worked out so well, which of course you never know when you start uh, inviting and asking people for contributions, because from, 19, uh, from 2015 to 18, I actually led a research project on peripheral expressionisms, uh, which eventually included 32 colleagues from 25 countries. Uh, and in the end, we published in early 2019 the volume on expressionism in a global or transnational context, which covers all of Europe, North and Latin America, and also South Africa. But what we are doing today is venturing beyond the scope. So this is really something which I find extremely exciting. And so, the focus is on the intellectual concept and also the artistic language. We will be looking at peripheral regions, at local communities, and also at the non-Western artistic context. And well, of course, we stay with contextualization, so it will be complex questions uh, of political, social, and cultural uh, issues, which of course have been then discussed in political activism, in alternative cultures, and of course the ongoing debates on anti-colonialism also play a major role in those presentations. I gave the speakers uh, the option of basically doing a presentation or also allowing for questions. Everyone is so apparently allowing for questions. So we will keep the papers to 15 to 17 minutes. And since the papers and the presentations are so heterogeneous, I would suggest that we ask three to four questions after each uh, presentation. Please keep your question short. I guess both languages are fine, uh, so that we can essentially treat everyone equally and that everyone has an opportunity to ask, but also to respond. And this is also one of the uh, issues why I will keep my introductions very short, because the bios are all online, so you can read them and basically look at this. So I will also be very brief in terms of introducing uh, our speakers. I think that should be everything for now. So let's actually move on to the first presentation. Our first speaker comes to us from uh, Slovenia. Mi uh, Miha Kolner is curator at the Museum of Contemporary, Modern and Contemporary Art uh, in Kostjavanica Nikriti. And he is also a very active uh, publicist and lecturer. He actually recently participated in Chemnitz at the European Realist Participation. And he will present to us Slovenia as a case study for peripheral manifestations of expressionism. Welcome here, the floor is all yours. Uh, hello, thank, thank you for your introduction. Um, let me just try that, okay, yep. Uh, yeah, what I'm gonna talk about today briefly is uh, um, examples from the, let's say, expressionism from Slovenia. The first, what I have to point out is that uh, Slovenia as such, which is now a state, uh, didn't exist back at the time. It was, 
part of Austro-Hungarian Empire, then later part of Yugoslavia. So uh, referring to Slovenia, I'm referring to the Slovenian culture milieu, which is usually defined by the language. Um, also, um, uh, my starting point, uh, why am I talking about the expressionism, is uh, all the exhibition that happened in 2018-2019 in Kostanovice na Krki, which is Galeria Bojderiakets, Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art. Uh, it was called Faces of Expressionism, and it showed the expressionism in Slovenia, but it was contextualized by examples of from Czech Republic, I mean Czechoslovakia, and Germany. So in that exhibition happened in um, Galeria Bojdariakets in Slovenia, and then later in Gask in Kutna Hora in uh, Czech Republic. So, uh, of course, there were certain kind of um, socio-political contexts that shaped the society and culture in the 1910s and 1920s. And of course, uh, the expressionism uh, in Slovenian context was, of course, shaped by that as well. Of course, I have to um, say that uh, the expressionism in Slovenia came let's say a decade, at least a decade later than in Germany. So it was actually also uh, influenced by the bloodshed of the World War I. Um, now, this is the image from the uh, exhibition of uh, Faces of Expressionism. This is the catalog, which is actually in, in, in Slovenian and German. Um, so, now a little bit of a historical context because it is very important. So, actually in 1918, after the World War I ended, um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire fell apart and the new state of Yugoslavia, like Czech Republic and Hungary and other states in, in this territory, was formed. <laughs> So basically the, the, the start, the beginning of the expressionism coincides with this historical event. And of course um, the, the artists were actually influenced by war, but not only by war. It was like a big rupture in the society, uh, which means that after the war uh, came the Spanish flu, came the, the actually uh, hunger because Austro-Hungarian Empire, like other central powers, were actually under the blockade. So there was not enough, basically, resources for people. So it was after the World War I, what happened was a big, um, a huge poverty and so on. So basically the, the, the expressionism as such was um, um, a very much, um, a reflection of that. But of course, uh, what was very important, so these are some of the artworks from, I guess, from the collection of this museum. Um, of course, the expressionism didn't just happen there authentically. Uh, the artists from uh, Slovenian territories uh, were accustomed, I mean, they, they knew the works of the German colleagues. Um, Mostly because after 1918, uh, the majority of artists from Slovenia started in Prague. Um, and of course, um, in 1918 to 1925, many, many artists were actually in Prague. And that's one reason for that is that uh, Vienna wasn't a thing anymore. Vienna was a capital of Austro-Hungarian Empire. But after the fall of the empire, there was a certain kind of resentment for everything German speaking. And of course, Prague as a uh, Slavic, uh, Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia as a Slavic country and Prague became the thing in this pan-Slavic sense. And Prague was of course very close to, is of course very close to Dresden. So uh, these artists were traveling a lot, so they knew uh, the art that was going on there. Um, and what's also um, 
interesting is that uh, expressionism as such is probably the first um, style or first movement in art that uh, actually included many, many different disciplines. So not only uh, painting, but also especially film, but also theater, literature, dance, and so on. So this is um, very, very important, uh, important thing. Uh, so now about the, uh, the first question, like about expressionism, is it a style? Or is it a subject matter? Uh, I guess it's both. Um, in case of uh, expressionism, there is a distinctive style associated with it. So it's like rough, raw, brutal, unembellished, morbid, exaggerated, and so on. But there's also something about the subject matter, like uh, the, the topics of uh, alienation of urbanized and in industrialized society, like about war horrors, ex existential issues, violence, and so on and so on. Now, I'll give you, I'll show you basically quite a lot of images. So we have this visual um, association of what I'm, what I'm saying. Uh, now, this is Loise Duliner, who later became a state artist in the Yugoslav kingdom. Uh, this is his very early work, probably the only work, a sculpture work of expressionism in Slovenia that uh, was made in 1913. It shows Matija Gubic. Matija Gubic was a mythical figure, the leader of a peasant revolt in 1573. Uh, and uh, because the, the statue was made in 1913, it was actually confiscated and de destroyed by uh, Austro-Hungarian police because talking about peasant revolts was very subversive at the time, especially prior to the World War I. So this is some kind of proto-expressionism in, in Slovenian context. Then Fran Tratnik, um, basically his drawings and, and, and prints that are showing uh, refugees um, and poverty. Fran Tratnik is very often associated with uh, Kate Kolwitz uh, as, a, as an obvious influence, even in the style, but also in the subject matter. But then when we come to the, the, the end of the World War I, like the most obvious um, um, figure in expressionism in Slovenia is uh, Francek Kral, born in 19, uh, 1895. Now, um, in Slovenia and also partially in Croatia, I'll show examples of both, both and contextualize them somehow with other images, other works. There are several subject matters that comes up um, and uh, artists were keen to follow them. The first one is social motives from the countryside, like the hardships of life, or urban motives, which were actually a reflection of artists studying elsewhere, because Slovenia didn't have urban centers um, or big cities. Then landscape, which is a direct continuation of a local tradition of painting that's actually dragging on from uh, Impressionism onwards. And very important is also there are the religious motives. Um, I'll give you a bit of a slide. Uh, so this is Franz Kral, The death of, death of a Genius. This is like a story about a misunderstood artist, quite common in, in, in the uh, expressionist context. Again, uh, a sculpture of an artist. And here we have some religious motives of Franz Kral who was also a deeply religious person. Uh, many of these artists were coming from the countryside, and uh, there was a lot um, of discussion here about the colonialism in expressionism, in expressionist painting and other forms of art. Uh, the territory of Slovenia doesn't have colonialism. It's the opposite. It was col colonized uh, itself. It was for 1,000 years, part of the Habsburg Empire. So basically, the, the Slavic populations have always considered themselves or were considered as the others. So what replaced this need for exoticism that uh, 
apparently expressionist artists had was actually turning to the local mysticism, local tradition, which was also pretty much uh, related to Catholicism, but also paganism. And we will see, you know, in the, in the images from the countryside, images of peasants, Im images of rural life, it is actually like the equivalent of what, let's say, German expressionists would do when they, some of them went to the colonies and depicted the others uh, there, you know, the, the exotic, ex exoticism, you know, of the others. So, um, these are still Francais Kral, uh, Descent from the Cross. Um, often expressionist artists in Slovenia, they, they would use religious motives as a metaphor for the hardship, hardships of life and social rebellion. So, because it's a rural state, it was a rural territory, many people had, I mean, the, 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 the life was not easy. Many people were struggling, and I guess more than 90% of the population lived in the rural areas. So, basically, they were peasants. Um, of course, um, here we have an example of Emil Nolde, like in a comparison. Of course, the religious motives were not rare in Expressionism, but there were actually in Slovenia, you know, in, in the proportion, there were many more. So, uh, another artist very important from the, for expressionism in, in this territory is Tone Kral, the bro brother of Franze Kral. And again, what we see here is a religious motive, uh, this time in a uh, medium of a woodcut. The graphic art was, um, the prints were very common in, among the expressionists in Slovenia because it was cheaper to do it than oil painting. Again, Tone Kral, um, the hardships of life. This is what I was saying, you know, the, the depictions of suffering peasants, you know, who are struggling for their, for their, um, for their everyday life existence. And then on the ruins, reflection of the World War I, you know, what happened after World War I was, uh, again, there was a new beginning, the new state, but the, the ordinary people really didn't have, uh, let's say, uh, a lot. So there was a constant struggle uh, in also in the aftermath of the World War I. Um, and again, some existential uh, issues. The, Three periods of life, you know, it's all it's about aging, about the passing of time, and so on. So what we see is kind of um, many many artists would have um, uh, motives. Um, artists from Slovenia would actually depict motives that are kind of typical for the for the expressionism in general. But they try to insert some local features into it. So again, for the comparison, Karl Schmidt Rotluf, woman with the bag, um, and um, yeah, Veno Pilon, another artist. So what, what's happening here? Oh, many expressionists would actually turn towards urban motives, and maybe expressionism was the first kind of first art form that actually tackled the reality. The Impressionism was running away from it, and then Expressionists were actually, you know, uh, talking about the real life. And um, in comparison, like, um, Slovenian artists, like, for instance, Veno Pilon, who, as well, like the previous ones, studied in Prague, uh, this reality was, um, Actually, there were, these were social issues. So here we have the etching, hunger, and another two basically uh, urban motives. The, the one on the left side is from Prague, the other on the, on the right hand side, I'm not sure where from, but their experience from, let's say, big cities where they started and lived actually was uh, reflected in their works. And of course, also the depictions of the countryside. This is the Veno Pilon road from 1923. 
uh, in his actually native town, or maybe better to say village. But on, on the other hand, we can see the comparisons again with, with the uh, examples from Czechoslovakia, Bohumil Kubišta, in a similar way depicting this actually rural countryside. So then another artist, very important, and who also um, depicted um, visions of urban life, because he was also studying in Prague, is Božidar Jakac. Our gallery, our museum is named after him, one of probably the most prominent artists of expressionism and social realism afterwards from Slovenia. So this is the uh, depiction of concert, probably from Prague. Um, and again, we have here social issues. And like in the 30s, it was very, very important that social realism was a big thing. Uh, but expressionism was very, very handy to depict social issues. Mm. Uh, sorry, just check. Ah, okay, yeah, I have to finish soon. So, um, yeah, let's say a typical uh, depictions. Uh, some examples from Croatia. This is again, you know, depicting urban life. Milivoj Uzelac, also Croatian artists, would study in, in Prague. Um, mm -hmm. um, and what you can see, Miha Malesh, now Viennese suburbia, um, besides the, the urban areas that they were depicting in urban um, mythology, urban themes, um, like Wilko Getzen, again, an, an artist from Prague, uh, from, uh, from Croatia, studying in Prague. Uh, what we have in the end, and which is also very important, is are the depictions of the landscape, um, like in vain of Eric uh, Heckel, uh, for instance, Anka Križmanić from Croatia, and this. These are, again, the, the, the typical depictions of, of the hardships of rural life. And this rural life, rural areas that are often depicted either in, in, the, in the pictures of landscapes, expressionist landscapes, or this slightly um, um, socialist, almost socialist realist uh, examples uh, are actually showing the kind of like authenticity of, of the, uh, this Slovenian version of expressionism. Of course, to conclude with that, there was also a nationalist component to this showing something authentic was the thing for, for the artists from Slovenia, which were suddenly liberated from this uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, but became part of, of uh, Yugoslavia. And uh, like I said, instead of the exoticism of others in different cultures in the colonies, they would depict uh, basically the exotic life of the countryside, exotic in comparison to the world that they learned about when they were studying in Prague or Vienna or other centers. I think that's it. So if you have any questions. So, I mean, mm -hmm. that there's always networks, artistic networks and others. And, of course, also in terms of expressionism, uh, the interest in the artistic style or content certain motifs, which play very often a role, which is, of course, also kind of what is transmitted. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, I guess in the Slovenian context, particular, also the national uh, and Catholicism and religion, the role mm -hmm. of those kind of dimensions in development. The floor is open for questions. Okay. Who wants to start? 
Thank you very much for, for the very, very interesting um, look beyond the, what we usually <laughs> focus on, which is uh, German expressionism. Um, uh, talking about networks and connections, I mean, you've, you've juxtaposed these, um, these Slovenian works with kind of works that we're all very familiar with uh, here from the Brücke Museum and elsewhere. Um, do you know anything about actual connections, artists, networks, how the Slovenian artists might have learned about what was happening in the German art sphere or actually in France or elsewhere through periodicals? Mm -hmm. And what were they? Yeah, I think because most of these images are from the early 1920s or maybe at most 1919, uh, the Expressionism in Germany was already established to the point that they could find examples in periodicals or learn about it through reproductions. Also, they were traveling a lot, so the, the accounts of the artists who were mostly studying in Prague, uh, going to Dresden, Berlin and other German cities um, because they were, they were curious. And in, in Prague was also a certain kind of center for new art forms, not only uh, expressionism. So I think being in this, uh, living and working in this Central European context must have been very inspiring. But the interesting fact also is that they all returned. Nobody stayed in Prague. Uh, only Veno Pilon, I think the, the, the third one that I showed, he moved to Paris eventually. <clears throat> but the fact that they couldn't stay in, in Germany or Prague was also an issue, a financial issue. Mostly, the, I mean, studying in Prague, it wasn't um, officially, at that time it was said, oh yeah, this is like a, a Slavic capital, Prague is, um, you know, Czech Czechoslovakia is a brother nation and stuff like that. But more or less it was also cheaper to live in Prague than, than in, in Berlin or Paris at that time. So it was a very practical aspect to it as well. <clears throat> yes, thank you a lot. Um, I was wondering about the um, status of these artists today. Um, are they as popular as Expressionism is in Germany? Um, and what is the history of that? Were they, you also referenced to the uh, period of when Slovenia was part of Yugoslavia, and how is it now? If you could just quickly sort of sketch how the reception of these artists went. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the, at the time, so in, in the early 1920s, when the book came out on the scene, the reception was not very good. I mean, the, the society in, in Slovenia and Yugoslavia in general was very conservative. They maybe accepted Impressionism by that time, but mostly, most of the people, and critics as well, were actually supporting, I don't know what, academic realism, something from the 19th century. Only, there was, I think, one younger art historian who was, sub, who was a generation of, of these artists who would support them uh, in a way. Um, then it became a little bit complicated because then critics after the, the, the period of Expressionism, uh, after 1925, when m many of these artists turned to Neue Sachlichkeit and, and social realism, they were much more content with it because Neue Sachlichkeit is much more classicist in how it looks. Um, but then uh, nowadays, um, I think the, the reception of all that is quite okay. But there was a slight uh, problem in the, in the period between 1945 and 1990 because, not because of the religious motives or anything else, but in uh, socialist Yugoslavia, the interwar period was not so um, important. So it, what was praised was whatever came afterwards. Uh, also, m many of these artists who, some of them lived all the way until the 70s, didn't switch to the new trends. So after the war, they didn't become like, um, you know, they didn't paint in style of late modernism. They didn't become abstract artists. They were kind of like, they persisted with their uh, versions, sometimes even expressionism, sometimes a kind of like social realism. So simply 
they were not trendy anymore. But most of them, which is interesting, they were on the height of their careers when the World War II started. They were in their early 40s. And it was a big break for most of them. The only one uh, who made a career was uh, Božidar Jakac, um, because he became a personal portrait artist for Josip Broz Tito, the president of Yugoslavia after the World War II. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you, have, um, do you know of some collections or early private collectors um, maybe collecting German expressionistic works after World War II, World War II or one or what was, is there something in Ljubljana, um, a museum that was early in collecting these things? Or um, other, other I, don't, I see the works coming from your museum or is there a special place in Slovenia, Slovenia for collecting these things? Yeah, I mean, nowadays most of the works of these uh, expressionists uh, would be in the Museum of Modern Art in Ljubljana, but even more so in Galeria Bozdriakac, where I work as a curator. Um, no, there were no co real collectors. I mean, art market is not a big thing in Slovenia, um, even now. Uh, so most of the works that we have in our collections is, was a, a direct donation. So artists, when they grew old, they didn't know what to do with their works and they wanted to put them somewhere in an institution so they would be accessible to the audience. So yeah, there was no, no, no big money or capital behind that and I don't think there were any private collectors who would, um, had a, who would have a plan you know, to collect uh, art of expressionism. It wasn't, it, it, I guess art didn't or doesn't have such a status in, in the Slovenian context still, and it didn't have it. I mean, visual art, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much again, Miha. Thank you. We <laughs> we'll do a major jump from Slovenia to South Africa, the connection not being Prague, but Berlin actually. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Lisa Hurstmann, who got her doctorate in art history in a global context with a focus on Africa from Freie Universität Berlin. And I was actually, um, I had the pleasure of uh, reviewing her dissertation on settler primitivism and the emergence of modern art in South Africa. And today she will be speaking about German expressionism and the emergence of uh, female avant-garde in South Africa, looking specifically at two female uh, figures which are quite prominent and of course also played a role in the Berlin art scene. Welcome. Um, hello, and thank you for having me here. Um, before I start, I just want to say that I'm using some extremely difficult terms, such as uh, primitive and native. And um, of course, those have to be thought in inverted commas, but because they reflect the structuring of South African society at the time and the discourse, I'm still going to use them. Is that better? Yeah, yeah OK. Irma Stern, painter of Africa and Africans, socialite and tireless traveler, leaned back in an immense carved throne-like armchair and sighed, I'm tired and homesick, homesick for the Congo forests and the surging, colorful waterfront of Zanzibar. Thus starts a 1946 interview with South Africa's most prominent modernist. The press eagerly recounted how, having passed her driving test in 1932, quote, she ventured into the interior of the Congo where few white men would have gone and set up a studio miles from the ne nearest European for a month, unquote. 
The colonies and British dominions functioned as a laboratory for a var variety of female identities. In South Africa, women expressionists were the driving forces of modernism in the fine arts. They profited from the primitivist idealization of properties such as intuition, authenticity, sensibility, and proximity to nature customarily ascribed to women. Additionally, as pri privileged members of a racially segregated society in which the exploitation of black labor supported the white elite, settler women had a more elevated and thus independent social position than their European counterparts. Thirdly, Irma Stern and Maggie Laubscher were also able to take advantage of the fact that upon their return from Germany in the early 1920s, the South African art scene was still exceedingly conservative, offering an opening for a female avant-garde. I do not intend to prove the entanglement of European art history in colonial stories of art, but rather to show ambivalent modes of authorship and agency in discussing two colonial women who used their privileged positions to transform the South African art scene. Irma Stern was the daughter of German Jews who had migrated to the Transvaal area in the early 19th century. She spent her early life migrating between Africa and Europe and purposefully made use of these transnational links in establishing herself as a successful artist. Having studied in Weimar and Berlin from 1913, she received considerable support from Max Pechstein, whom she met in 1917. He introduced her into Berlin's expressionist circles, where, building on her symbolic capital as an insider, she was able to position herself as an authentic African artist and connoisseur of primitive cultures. In her pictures of black women, whom she claimed she had grown up amongst, she quickly established an advantage over her German colleagues who knew their subjects only from occasional travels, visits to museums of ethnology, or interactions with black performers participating in ethnological museums or circus acts. The German press thus accorded her a greater genuineness than the European artists such as Pechstein or Paul Gauguin. In 1919, she had her first solo exhibition at Wolfgang Gorlitz Gallery in Berlin, which also represented the Brücke artists. Upon her return to Cape Town in 1920, she presented herself as a member of German Expressionism and used these transnational relations to legitimize her role as a modernist who had already been accepted by the male avant-garde in Europe and was now confidently continuing her career in South Africa. Stern kept exhibiting in Germany until 1933 and received um, several favorable press reviews. Those were, extremely, uh, those were extensively translated into English and Afrikaans by her supporters and reprinted in South African newspapers. They resorted to ideas of intrinsic femininity and stressed her South African indigeneity. While German critics considered her having outgrown Pechstein's influence, in South Africa, Stern stressed the support she was granted by recognized authorities such as Pechstein, Gorlitt, or the art critics Fritz Stahl and Max Osborne in clever self-portrayals that were largely appropriated and reproduced. Additionally, she used the negative press her first exhibitions in Cape Town generated to stage herself as the misunderstood artist genius. <coughs> On occasion of her first exhibition opening in Cape Town in 1922, that allegedly had to be disbanded by three policemen, the Cape Times published a, re a re review expressing, quote, frank disgust at the general nastiness of the work, unquote. And still in 1933, an exhibition review in the Sunday Times was entitled Agonies in Oil, Irma Stern Chamber of Horrors, Draw Crude Drawing, an Indian with Jaundice. In addition to the modernist style pursued by Stern, critics were also shocked by her portraits of black South Africans, which were not common at the time since they were perceived as endorsing blacks as beautiful. They depicted mainly African women in pre-modern attire, either relaxing or performing traditional tasks, supposedly untouched by Western civilization. Examples are water carriers of 1935 or bed carriers of 1941. Both exoticizing as well as sexualizing paintings 
showed traditionally dressed African women balancing objects on their heads. In a newspaper article entitled My Exotic Models of 1926, Stern described South Africa as, quote, the country of my birth, the land of sunshine, of radiant colors, where the fruit grows so plentifully and the flowers seem to reach the summit of all joy, where the brown people live a happy life in close connection with their soil, beautiful in their primitive innocence, unquote. Water carriers and bed carriers clearly comply with this primitivist idealization that casts black South Africans as, natural, as national cultural assets fit for artistic appropriation. Stern further stresses that in order to find such su subjects, she, quote, had to go where there was no sign of Europe, no trace of civilization, just Africa lying in the sun with its stretches of untouched land and its dark people as it had been lying, one might imagine, since the day of creation, end of quote. However, the artist was aware that this was not an easy task and knew that black South Africans did not factually live in a temporal vacuum. In contrast to the Arcadian idols she usually portrayed in her descriptions of South Africa, she is cited in a Cape Times article of 1927 to compl complain about finding the Zulu princess dressed in a blue Sunday print sitting on a map with a Bible on her lap, and the Swazi king gaining a reputation of being the best dressed man in England during his latest visit with the British king. These remarks illustrate the ambivalence inherent in South African settler primitivism. In contrast to their European counterparts, South African primitivists were in regular contact with the people they portrayed as archaic, timeless, and natural primitives, and knew that by 1930, very few of them were living the life they depicted and admired. By presenting their black compatriots as noble savages or pastoral farm workers, they pur purposefully disregarded their realities and fostered cultural differences instead. The latter is evidently discernible in an exhibition review by social critic and communist activist Richard Feldman from the mid-1920s. Irma Stern is the first to reveal to us the soul of South Africa's black children. The native in his surrounding is still nature's unspoiled child with a facial expression that is free of pose, a mind free of care, at peace with nature, content. There is, however, just one watercolor of a native woman in rags of full European attire, a derelict, an outcast, a product of the wilds of savagery transported in a civilized city. A terrible picture telling unequivocally the story of one part of a strong and healthy race that is deteriorating and degenerating. What a contrast to the native women in their home. Even though Feldman usually critically confronted race and class issues, the racist message clearly filters through that black and white South Africans should occupy separate habitats, blacks in the wilderness and whites in the civilized cities. Eight years older than Stern, Maggie Lobscher began her artistic career later in life. She studied painting in Cape Town, but as her works did not generate any financial success, she soon moved back in with her parents. In 1913, a friend provided her with financial support to go to Europe. She attended classes at Sla London Slade School until 1919, and after longer sojourns in Belgium, Northern Italy, and South Africa, she moved to Berlin in 1922, where she stayed for two years. Like Stern, Laubscher too was interested in German Expressionism and formed a friendship with Brücke artist Karl schmidt rotluff However, while Stern still had to refer to the approval of influential men such as Pechstein, Laubscher, whose career gained momentum after Stern had done the groundwork for establishing modernism in South Africa, always stressed that her art could not be attributed to any particular school or influence. Like Stern, she too made a substantial contribution to the parameters that determined the reception of her own work. She designed a Christianly informed self-narrative that embraced artist myths of, indep of artistic independence, ideals of simplicity and authenticity rooted in common Africana self-conceptions, and childhood memories in which her parents' farm played an important role. In her deliberately childlike renditions of landscapes, animals, and people, 
Lobsha played into contemporary primitivist preferences and benefited from women's allegedly natural proximity to those. Lobsha's primitivism differs from Stern's in her stylistic naivete that has often been compared to children's art. Instead of luscious nature and noble savages, her paintings largely show cultivate, cultivated land and black labor in an idolized setting. Her pastoral landscapes and farm scenes can be considered to naturalize the Africana appropriation of South African land, nature, and natives by proclaiming a God-envisioned harmony of cultivated land, farm animals, and black or colored farm workers. Her 1924 painting, Figures in a Landscape, Male Laborers, is a good example of the subsumption of black laborers into an agricultural landscape governed by wild, white settlers. The painting shows three male black agricultural workers whose faces are covered by hats and who, due to the color of their clothing and skin, seem to merge with the soil and the landscape surrounding them. With reference to a very similar painting, Effie J. Malherb, professor of Afrikaans at the University of Stellenbosch at the time, wrote in a 1959 government publication, note the three little goblins at work. Note the unity between them and their work. They live in this earth like the firmly rooted trees. The somber expression, expression in the natives' features accents Maggie Laubscher's profound compassion, her sympathy with the brown and black people. She can paint them as little gnomes on the land, giving life to landscape. In fact, she was the first of our painters who brought the human figure into the landscape. This last sentence underlines the fact that Laubscher's practice for the first time made visible the black labor on which white settlers depended. Jennifer Benningfield shows that commonly different landscapes were represented, quote, as natural environments for different bodies in South African art. The felt and the farm were retained as symbolic landscapes by the white South African. Depictions of black South Africans as farm laborers would have confirmed their particip participation in productive landscape and therefore threatened the myths which required that the white farmers themselves be the primary provider of labor." End of quote. Laubscher's painterly portrayals of black farm laborers as the central force of agricultural production were therefore much more ambivalent than one would at first presume. Like Stern's portraits of black South Africans, they raised public awareness of a group usually considered unworthy of representation. At the same time, Laubscher's landscapes were useful for the Africana nationalist project as they showed black workers as integral parts of the landscape and thereby naturalized their exploitation. Her pastorals that were received as depicting a supposedly childlike and timeless truth were thus ascribed an important role in the formation of an Africana identity in the visual arts. F.E.J. Malhab, for example, contended that, quote, Laubscher was interpre has interpreted the South African scene for us in a new manner. It stands to her great credit that she has applied a foreign style in a purely African spirit, and as such a way that her work is part of the purest, indigenous, and most original art we have, end of quote. Primitivist expressionism therefore also offered South African audiences a chance for the development of an own cultural identity linked to local specific specificities. In a fact sheet issued by the apartheid government in 1956, Diane Anderson argues that before Stern and Laubscher, quote, African themes were consciously or unconsciously Europeanized in what was essentially a colonial art only when South African artists began to study and to assimilate the true flavor of Africa, no longer as a faintly comic curiosity, but as an integral part of the national idea, were they able to score over their opposite numbers in Europe. He calls the result a truly, nationalist a truly national style and concludes that art in South Africa, young, strong, and living among the roots of the primitive tradition which has conditioned the zeitgeist of the present art generation has little to fear from the immediate future and much to hope. 
Thank you. Intriguing and problematic again each time one looks at those two women and how they played the African card in Europe very successfully, avant garde card there, and then of course really kind of got involved in this national uh, discourse altogether. Any questions from the audience? Hi. Thank you very much for your talk. I was wondering if there is any exchange or connection, a connection between uh, South Africa and US artists, either white depicting sharecroppers or uh, workers in the countryside or black modernists. No, I haven't found anything in my research about this. And I've looked at a lot of South African archives with a lot of press materials and letters and um, diaries. I haven't co come across this, no. Well, a similar question would be were there any black South African artists at the time? <laughs> that would be interesting to know. Yes, yeah. that's a very good question. Um, there were. The most well-known ones are Jared Sokoto and Ernest Mankoba. And they both left South Africa before the official apartheid um, policies were introduced. Ernest Mankoba in, I think, 36, and Jared Sokoto in 42. Both went to Paris at first and then went on to other European, well, Ernest Mankoba went to Sweden and Jared Sokoto stayed in Paris. And um, in a way, they were part of the South African modernist movement. And um, in their paintings, they also go back to this kind of primitivist perceptions of other black cultures, where they also go to, for example, Andabelle villages outside of um, Pretoria that also have this kind of tourist feel to them, where like rural life is shown to civilized people in a way. And um, while they were kind of accepted within this modernist movement, they themselves were also um, subjected to this primitivist reading by white artists. So there is um, an exchange between black artists and white artists, but on a very different, um, yeah, in a different hierarchy, definitely. I guess the social strata is quite important because, I mean, for Stern too, the Jewish networks is something which is very prominent for your career yeah. then also in South Africa. And I yes. think for Laubser then with the, with the settler movement, uh, there's of course a, a social strata which is quite important. Yeah, that's also part of the fact while Emma Stern, um, in contrast to Maggie Laubser, was able to just push for exhibitions in the 1920s when her art was really not acknowledged, but she had this Jewish network of um, supporters and also financial, like a financial um, base to start exhibiting from. So we can also encourage our digital viewers to ask any questions. Um, if you write them in the chat, then we will read them in the background and read them out. So don't hesitate to ask questions. Thank you very much. I would be interested um, in, a in a closer look on how the reception in Germany looked like. Of this. Um, so the, we have to differentiate then between the pre and post Second World War perception. Um, I think I already indicated that before the Second World War, especially in the 1920s, um, but also early 30s, Emma Stern was very much appreciated by German art critics. There's a few reviews that see her as a kind of um, copier of Pechstein, but as soon as critics are aware of the fact that it, she's actually South African, 
usually um, you can read that through the um, argument that then there's a very high appreciation of her as an um, expert in a way. And then after the Second World War, um, she is completely forgotten in Germany, even though she exhibited in 1956, I think, in Berlin and Munich. But then the exhibitions were reviewed in this narrative where um, peripheral expressionism is just um, secondary to German expressionism and not original. And Maggie Lobscher was almost not received in Germany. She did not exhibit in Germany. There was um, the um, founding director, I think, of the Bielefeld Kunsthalle, Joachim Wolfgang von Moltke. He is the only person who wrote something on Maggie Lobscher in German, but he was in South Africa in the 1950s and 60s, so he had met her there. Um, my question is concerning gender itself. If we look at um, gender in South Africa and gender in Germany, because it seems like um, in your presentation it didn't, or maybe you could just focus a little bit more on the differences there mm -hmm. and what it did it what did it actually mean for um, South African white South African woman coming to Germany and in which gender role she was there as in going back, maybe. That's, yes, that so um, I think what I said earlier, that she could benefit so much from her image as an insider of African life that was more important than her gender, probably, in Germany at the time. And also because people such as Max Pechstein, Wolfgang Gorlitt, Max Osborne, they all supported her because they were also interested in these issues and saw her as somebody who had some kind of expertise. She, I think, through this male support um, or validation or whatever, in Germany very quickly just um, was acknowledged and the fact that she was a woman in the press reviews that I still had access to now didn't play a role. And then in South Africa, I think um, the perception is definitely also, I mean, in Germany too, of course, it plays a role when I, say, when I speak of an artist as emotion-based and intuitive. These are all words that are related to how women are perceived. You know, it's not a um, considered systematic approach, but just like, um, yeah, an intuitive approach. So these terms are important, but in South Africa, there was no male avant-garde at the time. The style was academic realism, and the person who was the head of the three main institutions was a, um, also an artist who worked in that, in that way. So um, she was really the first one in South Africa to actually exhibit expressionist, modernist paintings, and then had her European success to rely on. So I'd, I think it probably would have been different if there had been men who had already been working in this mode. Thank you very much again. And we move on to the medium of the woodcut, which of course is very essential to expressionism and our third contribution on the new woodcut movement. Our third speaker is Erin sullivan Manas from the Los Angeles County Museum, where she is an assistant curator at the Robert Gore Rifkind Center for German Expressionist Studies, so very central and of course <laughs> essentially already by default a partner institution. <laughs> Her particular interest in curatorial practice is on histories of print and paper and the dissemination of print in the 19th and 20th century. And this is exactly what she will be looking at with a very specific focus on the role of Käthe Kollwitz and the new woodcut movement in China.
So welcome, Erin. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Thank you. I needed to come down a bit. Um, thank you, Isabel. Uh, thank you um, to our organizers. I don't want to spend too much time because I know everyone wants to get to their break. Uh, so I will just get started right away. Um, so the New Woodcut Movement um, is what I'm going to be discussing here, emerged in China in the early 1930s. It was made up of a handful of loosely connected artists who favored the woodcut as their primary medium for practical and ideological reasons, and whose subject matter was aggressively political. Its artists were leftists, and they attacked both China's Kuomintang-ruled nationalist government and Japanese imperialism. They remained devoted to the woodcut in spite of or perhaps because of its humble status relative to the other fine arts in China. And though China has the world's earliest tradition of woodblock relief printing, the movement's initial influences were modern foreign artists whose works were reproduced in Chinese periodicals, especially artists affiliated with expressionism. And I just want to say that I'm going to talk about the woodcut, even though there's this discussion also of woodblock, and if you're interested in the differences, which <laughs> I don't know that many of you will be, but if you are, you can talk to me after. Um, <laughs> The artist who has the strongest initial impact and whose legacy endured as histories of the group were written and rewritten around shifting political priorities was Kata Kolwitz. She was celebrated in a singular way by the founder of the new woodcut movement, Lu Xun, and was imitated and revered, sorry, and was imitated and revered by several of the movement's major artists. Over time, her status shifted from a source of inspiration to an iconic figure. This presentation will consider how Kolwitz became influential for these artists and why her status endured. But first, I will discuss writer and critic Lu Xun, the most important figure in the New Woodcut movement's aesthetic and conceptual development. Though not a visual artist, Lu aggressively promoted woodcuts through publications and exhibitions, and by pushing young artists to pursue the medium. He also encouraged artists to selectively apply ideas from Western art and theory, combining them with an understanding of the long history of Chinese cultural production in both its elite and popular forms to create a distinctly Chinese form of modernism. Liu was not naive, however, about what the West had to offer China. He wrote, quote, the problem is we've been scared by the things given to us. First, there were British opium and useless discarded German guns and cannons, then there were French cosmetics, American movies, and little knickknacks from Japan. Actually, it's precisely because they were given to us and not things we wanted to take for ourselves. In short, he concluded, quote, we should take things. We should use them, retain them, or destroy them, end quote. Liu dubbed his approach takeism, calling on Chinese artists and intellectuals to claim agency and choose models with intention rather than passively accepting whatever was available. Liu actively practiced such takeism himself with generous and generative intentions. He cultivated an extensive collection of woodcuts and woodblock prints from different periods and places. He was interested not only in traditional works, but also in popular forms such as Chinese nianhua or folk art prints. Liu also carefully curated and thoughtfully selected prints to reproduce in the various publications with which he was involved, sharing the works he thought would push young Chinese artists forward in their own practice. One of these publications was the periodical Morning Flowers in the Garden of Art. In the first volume, Liu wrote that the woodblock print started in China, but traced a longer history of printing from wood, oops, sorry, highlighting figures like Albert Durer and Thomas Bewick, the British originator of the wood engraving. Importantly, Liu made a distinction between prints used for reproductive purposes and what he called creative prints, uh, which he termed Chang's Muke, sorry, my pronunciation is probably completely off. The latter he called a, quote, genuine and legitimate art. These were, like the prints produced by the German expressionist and Japanese Tosaku Hanga artist, designed, cut, and printed by a single individual rather than products of collective workshop practice. Lu Zhan considered the medium of woodcut itself the most accessible and efficient vehicle for circulating revolutionary ideas and inspiring action amongst a broad and diffuse public. This was an important consideration given China's geographic spread, large population, and low rates of literacy. The graphic impact and directness of the black and white woodcut made it a potentially powerful medium for the masses. But practical concerns also made the woodcut an appealing option. Such relief prints were simple to produce, but also easy to reproduce. And reproductions could be printed using a combination of inexpensive photomechanical offset and relief processes without losing their visual coherence. 
The American expatriate journalist and friend of Lucian, Agnes Smedley, who I'll talk about a little bit later, would later call the woodcut, quote, a new art for the 400 million. And you see that text kind of here on the, the edge of this um, pamphlet um, for an exhibition that was in New York. Um, and this is sort of what I'm talking about, easy to reproduce. This is just kind of an offset printed uh, pamphlet, but it kind of lifting elements from prints, um, and they still kind of have this sort of same visual impact, so they don't lose anything in these kind of transfers, or in fact, kind of gain something. Liu singled out several Western artists as potential models, models for what he felt Chinese revolutionary printmaking could be in his publications and writings. All were of the left, made art that was political, and were printmakers, or at least their work was primarily produced, distributed, and consumed in print. One of these artists was Franz Masaryl. Lu wrote the introduction to the Chinese edition of his wordless woodcut novel, Passionate Journey, in 1933, and compared the book to the narrative strategies of Chinese long scroll paintings. Another was Carl Meffert. In an essay called In Defense of Comic Strips, Lu mentions both artists by name and discusses the importance of the serial format to their impact and appeal. But Lou had a special affection for the work of Kata Kolwitz, and his interest had a huge impact on how she was received in China in the short and long term. There are essentially three episodes that herald Kolwitz's introduction to Chinese audiences that I will detail here. The first was also a significant event in the founding of the new woodcut movement itself, a woodcut workshop, ooh, come on, there. A woodcut workshop in Shanghai that Lu Zhen organized with the help of the proprietor of the Uchiyama bookstore, Uchiyama Kanzo, in August 1931. This hands-on printmaking seminar was taught in a classroom of Uchiyama's Japanese language school. Uchiyama's brother Kaikichi came from Tokyo to teach the class, which instructed students on different processes for cutting and printing from woodblocks. Lu Zhen recruited young artists from different progressive arts groups. In all, 13 students participated while Lu acted as Kaikichi's translator. One of the students who described the experience later remembered, quote, whenever we had extra time left, Lu Xun would critique works by overseas artists. We were particularly impressed by those of Keita Kolvitz and Japanese Yukioe, end quote. Lu Xun, whose personal collection numbered over 400 works, supplied many, if not all, of the prints shared at this workshop. But according to the scholar Xiaobing Tang, he was most excited to share Keita Kolvitz's Krieg series, a portfolio of seven woodcuts he purchased directly from the artist with the help of uh, journalist Agnes Smedley. Lou noted in his diary that he gave Smedley 100 marks in April 1931 to send to Colvitz and received her 12 prints from Krieg more than one month later. Because there are only seven prints in the portfolio, it is unclear if Lou received additional works. He also reportedly gifted Kaikichi six Colvitz prints after the workshop as thanks. Agnes Smedley's connection to the story has also amplified Colvitz's place in the narrative due to Smedley's own larger-than-life persona. An American activist initially involved with the Indian liberation movement, Smedley moved to Berlin in the early 1920s to continue her political activities and began working as a journalist. Colvitz met Smedley at some point during her time in Berlin. She appears in Colvitz's diary and the artist sketched her from her sickbed in 1928. Smedley was eventually recruited to work as an agent in China for the common turn by Willy Munzenberg. As cover, she became a reporter for the Frankfurter Zeitung. It was in this capacity that she interviewed Lu Zhen in December 1929. Smedley and Lu became friends, communicating in German because neither was fluent in the other's native tongue. The second major event that foregrounded Kolwitz in the early history of the New Woodcut movement occurred less than one month after the workshop, the publication of Kolwitz print Das Opfer from the Krieg portfolio in the Chinese periodical Beidao. This was the first print by Kolwitz to appear in a Chinese language paper, and it was selected by Lu, Lu Zhen to commemorate the murder of five left-wing activists, later known as the Five Martyrs of the League of Left-Wing Writers by government forces. One of the murdered individuals, Ru Shi, was a close friend of Lu Zhen. He was also, incidentally, the person responsible for Lu's early interest in the woodcut. The work thus had a deeply personal meaning for Lu. In spite of this, the strength of Kolwitz's print is less its personal associations than its broad, even generic imagery, the figure of a nude woman, eyes closed, lifting a child in offering. It was, in other words, ripe for the kind of selective takeism Lou had advocated, making it possible for the work to readily absorb other meanings. This, combined with the woodcut's graphic punch, made Das Opfer a useful vehicle for memorializing what would become a significant event for the left in China. 
Xiaobing Tang has noted that after the publication of this work, Colvitz, quote, would ever after be associated with the cause of the left-wing movement, end quote. The final incident that heralded Colvitz's introduction to China was the publication of Lu Xun's book, Selected Prince of Cato Colvitz, in 1936. The text included an introduction by Agnes Smedley, which is, you see here, the kind of final page with her signature, and this is the cover. Um, an essay by Liu and 21 full-page reproductions of prints by the artist. Smedley's text, titled Kata Kolvitz, the People's Artist, was translated into Chinese and centered Kolvitz's political credentials. It frames the artist as one with the working class, which Smedley underscored by noting the artist's tendencies to embed self-portraits in her work, pointing out that the figure of Schwarze Anna, for example, from Bauernkrieg, is none other than Kolvitz herself. Smedley thus places the artist, who never identified with a particular political party, on the front lines of the class war. Lu Shen's text also cited elements of the artist's biography, but more importantly, he detailed how he had first encountered Kolvitz's work. His points of contact were not original prints like those smuggled by Smedley, but were like the book in which his essay appears, that is, collections of photomechanical reproductions after original prints. The titles included the Kata Kolvitz Mappe, published by the Kunstwart Verlag on the left, as well as Das Kata Kolvitz Werk, published by Karl Reisner Verlag in 1925 and 1930, and its sequel, Das Neue Kolvitz Werk, from 1933. Lou thus points to the importance of various kinds of multiples. He does not prioritize the original print, but both implicitly and explicitly encourages readers to meet the print where it appears, whether in a book, a periodical, or a portfolio, whether reproduced expensively or cheaply. Indeed, he celebrates the popular and cheap editions because they are available to a much wider audience. Importantly, prints by Colvitz reproduced relatively well in all these formats. Which brings me back to this woodcut by Li Hua. The work was made more than two decades after the woodcut workshop it commemorates, an event Li Hua did not even take part in. But one can see how Li's image is shaped by a now established or establishing historical narrative and how this single image documents the many ways these artists encountered and engaged with printed images. Lu Zhen stands at the center and holds out a carved wood block to the seated students at right for them to inspect. Some also grasp prints in their hands. Another, on the far right, pages through a book with illustrations. A periodical sits on the chair in the foreground, its title, um, illegible, and I've asked my colleagues, both uh, my Chinese colleagues and my colleagues in, in the Japanese departments, and they, they think it's a, a Japanese periodical, actually. Um, but even if the banner text is, is difficult to read, the woodcut image below that banner is unmistakable. And finally, two images are readily identifiable as prints by Colvitz. Both of the works represented in Li's print were reproduced in Lu Xun's selected Prince of Cato Colvitz, but significantly neither is a woodcut. Beim Dengel is a technically complex intaglio print mixing a variety of processes, while Rot is a straightforward transfer lithograph. But both are readily recognizable in this woodcut. Though they are abbreviated and reduced, Colvitz's graphic fluency transmits easily across media. As this image suggests, Colvitz's most influential works among Chinese artists were not the sparse and decontextualized woodcuts of her Krieg portfolio, but rather the forceful, compositionally complex, and multi-finger arrangements of her earlier Intaglio Bauernkrieg series. And I thought it was interesting that the earlier presentation talked about Colvitz being interesting also in this kind of context of peasant revolts. Um, that seems to be also what appealed about this particular series. Um, this interest is certainly reflected in the oeuvre of Li Hua, this artist, Li was one of the most important artists of the new woodcut movement. He studied Western oil painting, but turned to the woodcut by the mid-1930s, starting the Modern Woodcut Society in 1934 and the associated periodical Modern Woodcut the same year. Oops, I forgot I had jumped back. There we go. Influenced by Lu Xun, Li believed that the woodcut was the most appropriate means to inspire political action. And this is, a, this is the, the modern, uh, modern uh, woodcut periodical, and there were, I think, 15 issues, and they're very, very hard to find. There's only one in the British Museum, and this is that one that they have. Um, and they were printed on very inexpensive paper. In fact, one of the scholars I talked to said it was basically toilet paper. <laughs> so they don't survive in very large numbers. But the difference between this particular periodical and the ones that Lu Xun was involved in is this was printed from blocks, and so there were smaller editions, and the ones that were, Lu Xun was uh, distributing were offset, so they were produced in much larger um, editions. Um, his first significant work was Roar China, published 
1935, in modern woodcut, the, the print commemorated on the impending invasion of China by Japan. Though the figure is bound and blindfolded, his expression of rage suggests a determination to resist the Japanese invader at all costs. Xiaobing Tang connects Roar China to a Colvitz drawing reproduced on the cover of the 1930 edition of Ni Vida Krieg. Both images require contextualization to anchor their meaning. But while both screams function as expressions of anguish, Li's image is also an incitement to action. Roar China is emblematic of an earlier period of the New Woodcut movement in which a raw expressionistic style prevailed. But Chinese artists moved away from rough expressive cutting in favor of a cleaner, clearer style. As a result, their woodcuts became more didactic, ideological, and straightforwardly representational. Li continued to borrow from Colvitz, but was more strategic in adapting her work, effectively practicing the takeism that Lu Zhen had advocated and eliminating the ambiguities present in her prints in the process. This change is readily apparent in Li's four-sheet portfolio, Raging Tide, from 1946 to 47. Here, the object of Li's ire is the restored um, Kuomintang government in Nanjing. This is after the defeat of Japan in 1945. Struggle, the period, uh, portfolio's first image, exhibits an obvious debt to the first sheet in Colvitz's Bauernkrieg. Colvitz depicts the men as beasts of burden, their posture nearly parallel with the horizon line as they strain against the plow. In Lee's print, the men are similarly positioned, but the composition presents spatial recession, giving us a view of fields beyond devastated by drought. The crispness of Lee's line also allows us to see each man's pained expression. In contrast, Colvitt's image takes a moment to process. The composition is flat, figure and ground are parallel with the picture, with the picture plane, and the men's faces are difficult to discern. Other sheets from Lee's series, such as for Forcibly Constricting the Able-Bodied Men, similarly reference prints from Bowen Creek. However, Lee's images are more legible, and in Raging Tide, he simplifies Colvitz's narrative of political violence, elevating its heroic elements while eliminating her more ambivalent depictions. In Bowen Creek, the series ends with the sheets Schlachtfeld and, uh, and Die Gefangenen, the one on the right, detailing the defeat, punishment, and death that follows armed revolt. Forcibly constricting the able-bodied men is the second print in Lee's portfolio, an inciting event to the outbreak of violence. The last work in Raging Tide is Resist, the analog to Colvitz's Losbrook in Bauernkrieg. In Colvitz's series, negative outcomes follow violence, further victimizing the oppressed, while for Lee, oppression culminates in violence. He centers armed resistance as a form of political and social empowerment. In spite of Chinese artists' changing relationship to Western art and artists, however, Colvitz remained a touchstone. Li Hua would become a professor at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, where he taught from the 1950s until his death in 1994. He incorporated Colvitz into his coursework, instructing his students to copy the artist's works as he had once done. Colvitz herself also became a figure in narratives of the new woodcut movement, featuring in depictions of Lu Shun and the woodcut workshop into the 1970s and 1980s. And I'll end here, but I just want to show some of those later depictions, and this is something I'm still researching. Um, there's a lot of these depictions of the new woodcut, uh, the, the woodcut workshop, and then these portraits of Lu Jean. And so here you see um, the Colvitz Losbrook in the upper right. And um, come on, there we go. Here, um, Das Opfer, those kind of both of those prints having this important connection. So she's become this kind of figure that an independent of her work is attached to this historical narrative. So um, that's, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Erin, and I guess it brought us back very nicely from me uh, to you with essentially a strong artistic language, uh, which is taken up for the visual strengths and Colvitz, of course, being a role model. But of course, in the first two papers, the context more on kind of forging a national cultural identity, while here very clearly kind of using it for political activism. And of course, China is a very uh, different right, yeah. setting anyhow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the floor is open for questions. I guess you can start. Yeah, um, actually I have two questions. One, um, wasn't there also a tradition of a woodcut authentic to China and how it reflects in this work, if it does? And the second, um, did you also, what, the, what do Chinese scholars have to say about this topic? Because now we heard yeah. the interpretation about how the 
Chinese art was influenced by European art, but what do Chinese say about it? it those are both good questions. So in terms of the, the Chinese tradition I just mentioned, you know, yes, China has the oldest tradition of woodblock printing. Uh, it's, uh, you know, kind of the first, like the Diamond Sutra, which is in the British Library, is, you know, the oldest book, can, woodblock printed book. The difference between woodblock, which I said I wouldn't <laughs> talk about, and woodcut is that uh, you, uh, the, how you print. So they print with uh, water-based inks, and they use different uh, uh, carving techniques, and woodcut is, uh, they're, they're intentionally using the kind of techniques of um, these Western artists, the way that they're carving the, the materials they're using. So it is an intentional um, difference that they're drawing. And the other thing that's important about this is that the print had kind of fallen in, out of favor as a medium, as kind of an a, 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 um, you know, established artistic medium. It wasn't, it's sort of like it is actually in Europe and <laughs> America, like the print is kind of the lowest, uh, lowest medium. So to, e to even kind of embrace the, the print was making a political statement um, because you're basically saying you want to work in the medium that is, is most accessible um, and not elitist. Uh, so uh, that, and then in terms of what uh, Chinese scholars say, I'm just starting this research. I'm obviously not a scholar of Chinese material, but I've been, uh, a lot of the, there's not a lot of literature actually about this period, and there's a couple reasons for that, I think. A lot of it's coming from um, Chinese um, historians not necessarily art historians, um, because this moment is a difficult one to document. It's before the Cultural Revolution, and a lot of these artists fell out of favor during the Cultural Revolution. And, uh, and a lot of their work that's in China is not very accessible. Um, and there's only about four collections outside of China, and so I've seen a couple of them, uh, but uh, they're sort of strangely dispersed. There's one in like upstate New York, like the British Museum, there's one in France, and then there's one in Australia. So it's, and it's completely by chance, and what got taken, and, and what ended up in these collections was also by chance. It was just usually a single collector happened to be in China, was collecting some material, and then took it with them when they uh, left China. So um, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, it's complicated, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much for this insight into this uh, interesting phenomenon of takeism. Uh, what, uh, what kind of role does the term expressionism or expressive play? Uh, yeah. Are they used at all in this connection? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a really good question. Also, I, uh, this topic is new to me, and I don't read Chinese. And also, even in the translations, I never found the term expressive used. And as often happens, um, actually, with expressionism, you find when it becomes more of a political or popular or populist movement, I uh, can't keep this thing up here, um, it, uh, it is, ends up being rejected as a popular art form because it is, there's something kind of alienating about it to have this, you know, like a single artist doing something that, that most people find kind of visually um, not so familiar to them. So what ends up happening is a lot of these artists end up, when I was talking about Li Hua making ch changes to his style, a lot of that was in response to um, how his work was being received. And so there is a tradition, kind of especially in more rural parts of China, of like these Nianhua or New Year's prints. And so they kind of, a lot of artists ended up working in that style. And then some artists kind of pre-socialist realism work in a much more representational style. So they keep the political content and they keep, you know, again, kind of references to Kolwitz, but they, they change the way that they're presenting the material so that it is much more legible and understandable kind of immediately. So this, yeah, I think it, it's complicated, this term, because it's still kind of emotionally, um, it's emotive, but the style, the kind of cutting style changes um, in response. We are now in a post-war uh, contemporary art section, uh, and we actually start again in a peripheral region in Georgia, uh, and looking at the late 1980s, 1990s, I know from my own experience in uh, Tbilisi, this is a time essentially uh, when we have this kind of, the Soviet Union is falling apart or slowly kind of disintegrating, uh, and there's of course some kind of the question of uh, also kind of national identity, national cultural identity arising, and in this of course uh, we also have uh, alternative approaches to art going beyond socialist realism. So this is something which our next speaker will explore. Tamara Medishvili is a PhD student at Tbilisi State University where she's writing her dissertation in art history on 
the reception of German and Expressionism and Neo Expressionism. She's also very involved in the art world, having founded a studio which is not a museum and, of course, also working for a gallery. And she will be speaking today about the influence of German Expressionism in Georgian art of the 1980s and 1990s. So, welcome, Tamari. First of all, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, is it okay? Yeah. Um, my topic is about the influence of German expressionism and, uh, German expressionism on Georgian art in 1980s and 1990s. So let's start. A series of reoccurring events uh, in the social and political life of the Soviet Union in the late 80s and early 90s of the um, 20th century led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union regime. When in 1985, General Secretary of Communist Party of Soviet Union, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and his supporter began the political um, movement for reformation, political activities in society uh, increased, mass including national movement and organization were formed. As a result of economic and political crisis, the Soviet Union officially collapsed on, um, on December 26, 1991. Uh, the political uh, protest against the Soviet uh, dictatorship started uh, secretly but uh, intensively in 1970s, mostly disseminated in art society. For the, this period, counterculture as a term all, uh, was already being used by secret circle of Georgian artists. In parallel with the artwork of social realism, few composition on innovation team with uh, prominent uh, technique and individual artistic vision uh, are created. Young artists realized that for this period, the art of painting is much more by its mission and idea than just technically well-drawn composition. Uh, they started transferring of new ideas on the painting because of censorship. At first, it, um, the work are demonstrated in closed spaces. Uh, from the 70s to 90s, the Georgian counterculture had been represented by three main avant-garde groups. The members of the first group are, of artists were considered to be activist students and followers of abstract expressionism. The second group uh, consists of painters who linked innovation with uh, traditional elements. Third line of artists who named themselves uh, as tense floor artists were followers of German expressionism and neo expressionism. In the 1986, um, when one young artist, Mamuk Atsetsladze, was granted to a studio for uh, working on diploma <clears throat> on the 10th floor of the Art Academy, several friends were coming together for speaking about uh, European art. Quite soon, the friends were joined by other artists. As as well and turned into our avant-garde union. Uh, everyday discussion about modern European art transformed in, into the practical activities. The processes in the group were developed independently from, from the methodology established in the art academy. The influence and abstract, uh, com the figurative and abstract composition of the enormous size created by them were characterized by influence of German expressionism and neo-expressionism. Their spiritual leader, um, art scholar, Karlo Kacharava, um, spoke to um, the members almost always about uh, European art. Uh, he, um, he was an uh, art scholar and uh, um, um, participated in, in um, uh, many um, international uh, international conferences, so um, he uh, access to European uh, art very easily. The influence of German expressionism is felt in this in his creative life, Carlo Cacciaravas, for the most part. For the reason, I will uh, mainly concentrate my presentation on him. 
1991, he started to work at the gallery of Franz Josef Friedrich in uh, Köln, Germany. For that period, he produced a personal daily, Eine Reise. Um, telling about German impressions by many records and sketches. Uh, sketch created by one move of a hand is getting like the work of uh, uh, the union of the German expression is called the Brücken. In this note, Carlo Cajarava often mentioned uh, this art group and um, their artworks. We can see that on the page 91st the page of the um, personal daily, he mentions the name of uh, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner alongside uh, deformed figure of woman and dedicated to him that uh, sketch page entirely. It is evident even in his paintings that he is under the deep impression of art group the Broke, the um, work. For example, the topic of a necked woman, which always has a significant role in his work. Deformed bodies, natural or direct poses, and uh, unspecified faces immediately reminds us painting manner of this group. A notable resembles can be seen in painting uh, created in Moritzburg Lakes. Uh, for comparison, uh, we can take Arlok Ajarava's untitled Antwerp in Water, watercolor uh, in 1987, where three nude figures are depicted in the uh, background of the paisage. Uh, if, we, uh, if we compare to the few paintings created by the member of the art group, uh, precisely by Ernst Ludwig Kirchner and Mark Perstein, we will recognize that Carlo Ajarava. Okay, um, we will recognize that Carlo Ajarava used composition and subject from the first artist imagery of women's bodies from another. Uh, Carlo Ajarava never uh, painted uh, this artwork nor a series of deformed nude figures from a model because of censorship, but the facts say the same. He used the art group, the Brooks uh, artist um, uh, paintings from uh, his inspiration. For example, in an art composition dated 1988, we can uh, see empty room, a low formless figure of woman with a lengthened head, which is um, hands, which is some way resembles Ernst Ludwig Kirchner's composition, still figure, uh, sitting figure of woman, uh, made in 1988. 21, 23. While working on these nude figures of women, Carlo Kajarava expressed his emotion and pro protest towards the Soviet Union through the form and raw elements, uh, secret, um, strict regime, censorship, and close borders uh, engendered depressive impulses on him which is shared in his notes frequently. Uh, imita imitating uh, German expressionism, he also expressed his emotions through the deformed uh, nude bodies of women, using woman bodies as a vessel uh, for um, ex expressing feelings, can be seen in an art composition, Leben, 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 dated 1987. In uh, that artwork, the artist painted his outer portrait and necked figure of a woman on the background of uh, close pace. Again, the artwork's theme and subject returns us to expressionist works. For uh, comparison, we can take Autoportrait created by Ernst Ludwig Kirchner in 1911, titled Self Portrait as a Soldier. Uh, where an artist in limited, uh, military uniform stand before a nude figure. Its form of expression speak about the author's uh, spiritual and mental uh, state. Kajarava also used naked women, uh, women in, uh, in deformed figures as, uh, at the side of his autoportrait. Uh, um, the artist had uh, in, um, is bent um, down, said expression and uh, passive uh, gesticulation of a head indicated uh, his negative mood. He does not abandon harsh and active colors and uh, black outlines. 
uh, often real or imagery uh, personages created by uh, Kacharava began to look like to character models of the art group De Broeke. In his late 80s, um, artworks look like figures depicted by Ernst Haeckel with their long face, high front, and almond shapes eyes. Bodies. Um, um, Okay. Besides uh, this, the uh, po poses of the figure are also imitated. In the 90s, Carlo Cacciarava slowly li liberated himself from German ex um, expressionism influence, and in the uh, following period, he obtains elements of pop art, uh, neo-expressionist, and contemporary art, keeping gener um, general features of expressionism. This is a Maya Tsetskhladze. Um, Maya Tsetskhladze's art uh, consists of abstract and figurative artworks. Her painting technique is mixed and she works in, uh, on canvas in a large format like other painters of this group. The artist repeats colorful patches, hatchings, and um, contours characterized of Vasily Kandinsky's in her few canvas. Her artwork are influenced by neo-expressionism and the art group, the Blue Rider. Uh, Riders on the plate, painted by uh, Maya Tsetskhladze in the end of uh, 80s, was inspired by Kandinsky's artwork, which we later can be recognized as the artist group, the Blue Rider. The composition repeats the theme, colorful scale, and strokes of Kandinsky. Um, we see Kandinsky's influence in her art, in a few artworks, um, precisely in the French art composition dated 1988. The artists in this art composition depict a figure, but like in Kandinsky's uh, composition in, uh, interpretations, on the front plane, a figurative element is de um, diminished in expense uh, to abstract imagery. In addition to the colorful patches, we see the sharp hatches and con contours related to the expressionism repeated so often in her art. Artwork, the bird with flower and the abstract composition journey of bird re uh, represents the best uh, illustration for this case. Uh, the tenth floor artists uh, work in one uh, space, but we are not considered as an art group in the beginning. They, uh, the pl their place was, was free all, uh, for all enthusiasts to participate in discussion or uh, practical activities. For that reason, the creative work of the group members um, uh, differed from each other. The artistic manner uh, varied, but working team uh, were uh, uh, almost the same. We can say Gia Loria's uh, uh, The Blue Rider. Uh, Gia Loria's Blue Rider artwork created in this period is a very good in, um, example for this case. His creative work is uh, less influenced by expressionism among other art group members. He used the name of the expressionism art group as the artwork title. Uh, and we have uh, the examples like this, uh, Arlok Ajarava's uh, composition, the general, uh, created in 1987, represents the best example of expressionist influence. The same, of gen uh, the same theme of general, repeats in Maya Tsetskhladze's and Niko Tsetskhladze's artworks. Uh, we, um, now, we can see Nick Otsetskladze's uh, compositions. Nick Otsetskladze has been an active member of this group since the beginning. Uh, in uh, his uh, abstract and figurative large um, size canvas, uh, he used narrows and emotional uh, brush strokes, sharp colors, and block, um, black contours, characteristic of expressions. But after the same time, new expressions became more uh, interesting for him rather than German expressionism. 
the uh, same uh, um, topic we can see in Liashwelidze's untitled um, composition. Liashwelidze was a, a part of this group. In general, art of Liashwelidze is dedicated to the topic of woman and her woman's uh, um, personage often has sharp co uh, colors characterized of expressionism. Uh, one of the first conceptualist Georgian artists, Mamuk Ajaparidze's few art was created in the late 80s, uh, carries expressionist features. He began uh, to work with the um, um, art group, the 10th floor artist, and painted pictures where text and visual imagery are com combined excitingly. He, uh, his art posters for fiction gallery, uh, he has an art project, fiction gallery, uh, reminds us woodcasts of the uh, art group, The Broken. Uh, also, um, one member of the art group was Surab Sumbadze. His work under the influence, um, he works in, under the influence of German expressionism too. Lino Gravior artworks, uh, Diff Mute, created in 1987, reminds us gravures of German expressionist painters by its forms of depiction. The painting's personage uh, in the center of the composition shouts uh, shockingly, his, uh, his stressed uh, body, um, uh, upwardly raised head and lightened hand uh, leaves a heavy emotion feeling in his uh, in uh, spectator. Um, by the manner of the painting, theme and subject matter, we can uh, say that it is a specific interpretation of uh, Edward Munch's uh, this artwork, this cream. And in the end, uh, I can say that the tense floor artists during their uh, coexistence in general outside of country uh, as well as in Eastern Western Europe have uh, several exhibitions. In particular, they have exhibition in Eastern Berlin in 1987. In 1990, uh, 1988, they arrived in uh, Narva where they take part in Narva art festival. In the same year, uh, one part of the artists exhibited their work in the Franzose Friedrich Gallery in Köln, 1989. Uh, the 10th floor artists arrived in Western German, where they organized two exhibition showcase and visited Franzose Gallery uh, in second time in this uh, same year. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Also very intriguing visual examples. And actually, I would write, ask you a question right away, uh, particular with Caro Caravana. Uh, where did he see Brücke artist works? Did he travel? Is it from books? Or where, yeah, what um, was his? How did he encounter the art of the Brücke? Um, you asked me about about, about him specifically. Yeah, um, he participated in, in different uh, conferences. Uh, he was art scholar, so yeah, in, held in different countries. So, so he so traveled, he and actually yeah. are the originals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. It was his idea to create group and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, but so, so he had the originals in, in, in view. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I, w I would like to know more about um, why, I guess, every single artist has a different reason, but for example, like how, why Ka Carlo Cara... Carlo Cacciarava. Caccia? Cacciarava. Cacciarava. Carlo Cacciarava. Um, what he found interesting about the Brücke, is it the aesthetics? Is it the politics? Is it maybe also because he has German... Is, does he want to reach a German audience? What? What was it that sort of brought him there? Mm, um, we think, uh, I think, and not only me, that uh, his love of uh, German language, he knew uh, German language very well, uh, and his love of German language and culture, culture distinguished the influence of his art and 10th floor artists' style. Yeah, so it is. Actually, if I can just connect to this, what's the relation to the avant-garde? 
uh, particularly I'm thinking also with uh, Larionov and Goncharova, and then also kind of non-conformist art at the time, because they are also looking at like uh, basically Larionov and his scribblings and stuff, which comes very close. Uh, yes. And of course, so, there is this connection between the blue yes. writer bringing in Bolyuk and a few others of those early 20th century artists. Yeah. Um, um, what is the question? I, I agree that uh, they have a connection between. So basically, how did they forge their position between yeah, the interest in German expressionism, but also kind of the, the Russian avant-garde, which of course is multinational, uh, which is also has ties to the Blau Rider? Mm. Oh, I don't understand. Okay, we'll discuss this later. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, actually, it was a bit in the same direction also my question um, concerning uh, why there was this interest in, for example, the Blue Rider artist like uh, Kandinsky and are there any written statements or orally transmitted statements? Is there, uh, are there any texts by these artists, for example, by Maya uh, Zetzglatze um, on these questions? Why is they interested? Um, you know, it was uh, for Georgian, it was very hard period. Uh, and uh, I want to say that um, everything uh, was like uh, sp spontaneous. It was the space, the tenth floor artist's space. Uh, it was free space and they were just together and talk about everything, what they knew from Europe, for example. So uh, they uh, don't uh, pl plant what to paint, at what to do. It was very spontaneous. So that's why uh, someone heard about Blue Rider and started painting like this. Someone heard about uh, uh, Brooke artist. Um, yeah, it was. <laughs> Thank you very uh, much for this very interesting uh, talk. I have a question from another um, perspective. Considering uh, this artist as a, a neo oven um, a god, my question is um, regarding the relation uh, chips to their. Uh, to other contemporary uh, artists of this time, which were popularized, for example, in the Zeitgeist uh, exhibition in Berlin, New Spirit and Painting in London, or uh, Après le Classicisme in uh, Saint Etienne in Germany, largely they considered as uh, new, express, uh, ex new expressionists uh, too, even though there are um, other um, uh, names for it, like Heftige Malerei or Junge Wilde. The relation to other contemporary uh, artists? If they have a relation, uh, they have influence in their art. You ask me about this, yeah? Yeah, if, I mean, you showed um, um, that uh, uh, studied yeah. in, uh, in Dusseldorf, uh, uh, I think they had some uh, exhibitions in the late. Uh, 80s in, ah. uh, in Berlin. I mean, uh, ah, then it the was end. already an, the end of uh, of, uh, of these uh, movements. But it would be interesting uh, to, to know something about uh, the relations uh, between these new um, avant-garde, which are all looking anyhow uh, back in a certain uh, way to uh, to express the nation. Oh. I really don't know. I I think. Um or perhaps I give it um, to you as a, um, an, as a research um, a perspective. If you don't um, uh, know the uh, answer, I would like uh, to mention uh, Milan um, Kunk, a Czech, uh, which uh, was a part of the group uh, Normal, or Iri um, Duku, a uh, member of the Mülheimer Freiheit. The question, basically, the, how is the position or the relation to neo-expressionism at the time, which I mean is... It's happening right at the time. It's also presented in exhibition. Now I cannot speak. <laughs> well, um, I think it's uh, something that uh, might be a topic to research upon, um, but maybe there are not really um, like the current um, information in, in the books yet that you have seen. Um, let us continue, I maybe. Guess this is part of your dissertation. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Any other? 
Thank you. We are moving on to Iran. <laughs> Actually, staying more or less on the region. Our next speaker is Katrin Nahidi, and she is a research associate for modern and contemporary art in the Art History Institute of the University of Graz. Uh, she wrote her dissertation on, I guess, Iranian modernism, uh, because she only gave me the project in which, you wrote, uh, which it was part of, which was basically other modernism practices and patrimony of visual expression outside of the West. And this is exactly what you will be looking at also in your presentation. And I guess we also are expecting your book very soon, uh, which will be on the cultural politics of art in Iran, modernism exhibitions and art production. So the floor is all yours. We look forward to your paper. Yeah, many thanks to the organizers of the conference, and I'm really happy that I can present my topic on Iran in the broader context of um, expressionism and here at the conference. Um, in my presentation today, I would like to show that um, expressionism can be a fruitful uh, category of an um, analytical method for modernist Iranian art. A closer look at selected artworks and Iran's modern history will show us that the adaptation of expressionist tendencies played a significant role in the developing of Iranian modernism. Expressionism's political agency provided the Iranian artists a crucial visual language to address concepts of modernity beyond secularity and rationality. Um, Iran's modern art history has been modeled after stylistic categorization and terminology of European art history. This canon has established a hierarchical order of modernist art and narrates a story of modernism's evolution in Iran based on the idea of linear artistic progress. The adaptation of expressionism marks for the art historian Ruin Pakbas a major point in the evolution of modernist arts in Iran. I quote, the first Tehran biennial highlighted the advent of expressionism upon the contemporary Iranian art scene with its religious portrayals of the rituals of prayers, breast beating on religious days of mourning, congregational sermons or its glimpses of the shifting moods of people and inanimate objects. However, expressionist tendencies, and I borrowed my title from Ruin Pakbas, um, represent for him immature experiments with Western modernity. For him, the adaptation of expressionism was only a short phase, and each of these painters outgrew the stage and developed his own independent style. Um, according to Pak Bas, the painter Hushang Peseshknia represents a positive exception because he touches on social realism by depicting oil workers from the province Khuzestan. Piseshkian's artistic example shows that modernist expression was an important means to depict the labor conditions of modernization in Iran. Mohammad Reza Shah's wealth and his modernization programs were built on Iran's oil industry. At the same time, Iran's political economy of petroleum is closely linked to colonial and imperial interferences, which started with the colonial oil concessions from 1901 to until the 1950s and culminated in the coup d'etat against the democratically elected Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh. The coup was carried out by members of the Royalist Army and financed by British and American secret services and led to the reinstatement of Mohammad Reza Shah as the autocratic ruler of Iran. With the devastating consequences for power politics and the end of Mossadegh's democratically elected government, these imperialist interferences constitute a major source of trauma for the Iranian intelligentsia. These political events gave rise to the establishment of the anti-colonial political discourse in Iran. 
In the aftermath of the coup, Iranian intellectuals such as Ahmad Faradid and Jalal Ali Ahmad formulated under the umbrella term Garb Sadigi, West Oxification, a major critique of the Shah's modernization programs. This critique contributed decisively to the politicization of Islam, which eventually led to the Islamic Revolution. In the 1960s, the artist Hossein Sindiroudi depicts in his work, Who is this Hossein the world is so crazy about? The tragic death of Imam Hussein in the Battle of Karbala. This connecting of modernist visual expression and religious iconography demonstrates that modernist expression was not a secular enterprise to explore Western means of expression from a formalist point of view. The exploration of Shiite iconography in a modernist language was an important tool to situate artistic expression in the ongoing political debates. With his artwork, Sendi Rudi suggests a possible modern Iranian identity, which is to be found in the alliance of Iranian and Islamic identity. Thus, Sendi Rudi questions the country's successful secularization and shows that his search for an Iranian artistic modernity was based on an immersion in, religious, in Iran's religious traditions. In particular, in Persian visual arts, the Battle of Karbala and the Cult of Martyrs are not only important elements of Shiite belief, but also form the narrative content of its iconographic tradition. Mm. Using a powerful black and white aesthetic, similar in style to a comic strip, Sendi Rudi depicts 10 episodes of Hussein's political and religious fight against Yazid, the Caliph of Damascus, uh, whom Imam Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, refused to recognize as the rightful successor of the Prophet. With his family and a group of loyal uh, followers, Hussein left Medina to support um, his adherents in Kufa, who were fighting against the Caliphate. In Karbala, Yazid's troops cut Hussein and his followers off from any water supply. Yazid's forces expected Imam Hussein's capitulation, but on the 10th day of the occupation, fighting bro bro broke out. Hussein and his followers were powerless against the military superiority of Yazid's troops. Mm, the Prophet's grandson and his followers were violently murdered in the Battle of Karbala, and the women and children were taken hostage and brought to Damascus. For Shiites, the Battle of Karbala is the cornerstone in the struggle for the line of succession to Prophet Muhammad and in the, is the cause of the division of the Muslim community into Sunni and Shia. As a result, Karbala functions as an important trope for Shiite identity formation and has left an undeliable mark on Muslim consciousness. In his artistic rendition, Senderudi particularly emphasizes the most dramatic scenes in the course of the battle. For example, the rectangular scene in the second row from above. Um, shows how Hussein commemorates and cries over the death of his son Ali Akbar in the midst of the battlefield. The next scene illustrates Hussein's decapitation in front of Yazid's army. The soldiers are carrying the severed heads of Hussein followers on top of lances. In the last scene, Sendi Rudi depicts Imam Hussein's defeat. Yazid sits together with the battle, only survivors surrounded by Hussein's female relatives with Hussein's head on a tray in front of him as a spoil of war. The outer frame surrounding the episodes represent a significant compositional and textual means of identifying the theme of Sandy Rudy's image. In the inscriptions framing the composition, one repeatedly encounters the sentence, which is also the painting's title, who is this Hussein the world is so crazy about? This illustrates that um, Sandy Rudy is exploring the theme of um, Hussein's suffering. The second sentence, inscribed only once at the bottom of the frame in Sendi Rudi's print, translates to 
Who is this flame for which all souls are moths? The met metaphor of the moth and the flame is a widespread motif in Sufi literature and denotes the concept of fana, the annihilation of the self that leads to the seeker's unification with God. In his Linokat, Sandy Rudi brings together two inscriptions, both referring somehow to the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. The symbol of the moth also recalls the martyrdom and is memorialized as the ultimate signs of annihilation and unification. At the same time, contemporary art critics recognized Sandy Rudi's question, who is this Hussein the world is so crazy about, not only as a reference to Imam Hussein, but also as artistic signature. Mm, because his name is also Hussein, Hussein Sendi Rudi. Um, with his illustration of the Battle of Karbala, Sendi Rudi clearly refers, refers to the artistic tradition of Pardes. These portable linens are an important means for oral, visual storytelling in Iran, which became very famous in 19th and 20th early century. The historical events of the Battle of Karbala are the main subject of the Pardes. Um, they are portable linens and um, the audience listens during the storyteller's recitations of the events. Looking at Sandy Rudi's artwork, however, it also becomes clear that he broke with the pictorial traditions of Pardes as an artistic genre. The story unfolds horizontally, such that the storyteller can walk back and forth in front of the painting during the performance. And the depicted episodes of the narration are visually intertwined and cannot be separated. In order to preserve conventions of um, decorum and distinguish them as good, Hussein and his followers, the holy persons, are portrayed in visually appealing manner. Despite their suffering, their faces usually bear no signs of the pain they are enduring. This distinction is also reflected in the color symbolism. Green indicative of sacredness, yellow distress, and red implies oppression. In contrast to this tradition, Sandy Rudi depicts his scenes in black and white. His uh, narration unfolds vertically, not horizontally, and follows a clear narrative structure from top to bottom. Cindy Rudi cut each episode in linoleum sheet and printed the compilation of the partition scenes on a large linen cloth. Thus, as a printmaking technique, Linocut supports the specific compositional organization and the partitioning of the episodes. He, scar he carves sharp sketch-like drawings into linoleum in order to depict his version of Karbala in rough scratches without refined details. Sandy Rudi's expressive execution of the portrait figures and his selection of Linokat as an artistic medium recall expressionist aesthetics. Thanks to its international dissemination in the 20th century, expressionism was considered a major avant-garde movement and had become a, a signifier for Western modernity in Iran. The immense success of um, Der Blaue Reiter and Die Brücke can also be attributed to the media of printmaking and graphic arts as important means for artistic exchange across the world. In the aftermath of the First World War, expressionist and leftist artists devoted their artistic practice to posters, leaflets, and following the October Revolution in Russia and the November Revolution 1918 in Germany, expressionism became the artistic language of revolutionary art. Especially after the traumatic war experiences during, war, during and after World War I, expressionist aesthetics became an effective language to articulate destruction and human loss. Mm, with its uh, specific with this uh, specific um, characteristics, expressionist aesthetics provided the right stylistic elements to paint images of apocalypse, universal suffering, and redemption. These kinds of aesthetics are also observable in Sandy Rudi's artwork. 
In light of Expressionism's political agency, it becomes evident that Sandy Rudi's turn to Expressionist forms was far more than a signifier of Western modernity. Expressionism provided a political legacy and an effective yet figurative language to reject the decorum of the established Shiite iconography in Iran. Sendi Rudi narrates the events evolving around the Battle of Karbala in a clearly structured composition from top to bottom. This me means that contemporary viewers equipped with the necessary and widespread cultural knowledge could easily follow Sendi Rudi's presentation in a gallery space. The image comprehensibility makes the oral recitation of the traditional storyteller redundant because the Linokat itself tells the story. Sandy Rudi's artwork shows how modernist art provided fertile ground to explore Iran's discourse of martyrdoms, of martyrdom on visual terms. This also clearly refers to the ongoing debates about Rab Sadigi in Iran, which saw Iran's Shiite religion as the only possible cure for, for the country's vex oxification. What does that mean for expressionism in Iran? I would like to summarize by saying the merging of Western elements with Iranian visual traditions was not a formal, but rather an analytical artistic strategy in Iranian visual arts. This means that the analytical and critical deployment of expressionist forms in Iran was simultaneously an intellectual and aesthetic language to address the epistemic violence of modernization. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. This actually leads me to the uh, question of which I don't want to raise immediately. If expressionism in terms of artistic style and also aesthetics uh, lends itself much better to alternative modernism than, for instance, abstraction. And I think that's a much larger question for a workshop, uh, but this is something which came immediately to my mind. Um, but the floor is open for questions uh, concerning the paper, immediate reactions. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Um, and I'm, I have to admit firsthand that I'm walking on very thin ice with my knowledge on modernism and contemporary art in Iran, but I have one thing came to my mind with the strong reception of Bauhaus aesthetics in Iran. Was there a competition within the country between these two you know, Western European art forms and their employment in the political agenda of Iran at the time? Mm. Not really. The art scene was pretty small. So at that time, they, they collaborated. They did not work together. So it's not so clear. We have some Bauhaus tendencies in Iran as well. Karl Schlaminger, who was a um, student of um, Itten, uh, worked in Iran as a professor and for art education. And um, like there, there is one art movement, and Sandy Rudi is also considered to be one of the founding members, uh, Sarah Khone movement, which is considered as the Iranian Bauhaus movement, who wanted to be more like, um, yeah, uh, who concentrated on handicraft and traditions and so on. But it's not, they were more, the, there was not so much a competition between Western styles, but more a competition of how can we be. Iranian, how can we be modern? And um, we, it is really interesting because it starts in the 1950s that we have in Iran discussions about exoticism that we uh, see in contemporary art, um, yeah, much later. Yeah, um, um, you mentioned the tradition of storytelling mm -hmm. that uh, started appearing, I think, in 1920s and onwards, if I understood correctly. Um, so that was kind of like a visual storytelling. Can you just tell a little bit more about it? Oh yeah, Ashura is really, uh, it's, it's like uh, the passion, like Chris, it's similar, it's not like, it's similar to Christian uh, passion plays. And so it has to do with Ashura and it's like, it's a, a couple of holidays in Iran and you can still go and they have theater plays, they uh, do this recitation in coffee houses and outside 
um, during this time, during the modernization under the Shah, it was prohibited because they wanted to secularize the country. And uh, also the Ashura processions, they were quite violent because they were beating up um, themselves and so on. And um, the Pahlavi state tried to secularize the country and um, to communicate the image that Iran is basically a Western nation state and unfortunately through geographical circumstances they were not a part of Northern Europe or the US. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a more, um, a little general question. If there's a strong reception of um, German art from the 20s and 30s, and we are talking ab about uh, many racist elements in these pieces, after what we um, experienced last year, I would like to ask if you also research about stere racist stereotypes in uh, iron paintings or culture like anti-Semite stereotypes and so on. This is also, uh, because this is what we learned now, that there's a huge tradition and reception of this kind of racist markings also in the culture of mm. the countries, yeah. of East, Eastern yeah. parts. This was not so much my topic, but um, it's a very interesting question because Iranians themselves um, identify as uh, Aryans. And this is the story that they tell. And it's not only that they told the story, the, uh, the story came through archaeology and Ernst Herzfeld, um, who promoted this um, ideology that Iranians are basically white. And, uh, but this is more something in cultural politics, which was, um, yeah, the artists did not, they were more um, invested in the anti-colonial struggles, which they would deny today because this is a historic perspective, but when I conducted artist interviews, I do this uh, now, and now we, have the reality, now we have the reality of the Islamic Republic, and nobody wants to have any connections to the anti-colonial struggles or wants to uh, admit that they have religious contents in their artworks, and um, this happens also to, yeah, to some artists, and when I try to talk about uh, when I tried to talk to them about politics in their artworks or religion, they were, no, you get it totally wrong. We were just interested in uh, formalist experiments. But, yeah. And there's another problem of memory and memorialization because um, today's political situation is rather problematic in Iran. <laughs> Thank you for this fabulous talk. Um, I have a very basic question. Is this picture being read from left to right or from right to left? What is the reading order? Um, Both ways, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. But it's, in, uh, it's uh, at the British Museum, and from time to time they display it. And, yeah. and they have very nice. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And we move on to our last speaker who got his visa for Germany only yesterday morning, rushed to the airport and actually landed this morning shortly after nine or before nine o'clock in BAR and came right to the conference. So this is really dedication uh, and effort. So. I'd like to welcome Raoul Deff, who is an art historian who teaches art history and German at the National Museum Institute in Delhi. And he wrote his dissertation on German Expressionism and its reception in Indian modern art. 
it's not your first time in Germany, you have been in and out, and you're also involved in the Documenta Archive, the ASEAN Ar uh, Art Archive, and a few other institutions. And I guess you stick to your main research topic and will talk about German Expressionism and its reception in Indian modernism today as well. Welcome. So, uh, I would like to extend my gratitude to uh, Professor Wünscher and the organizers who invited me and I made my trip in the last moment. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, uh, how can I uh, slide? Okay. So, yeah, thank you. So, uh, this, so these are uh, research questions which I started uh, my research, uh, so I just want to show you. Uh, so, so, yeah. So uh, my presentations deal with the reception of expressionism in Indian modernism, specifically concentrating the period uh, of late 70s and 2000 by understanding the historical significance of European expressionism. The research profoundly explores how expressionist idiom become one of uh, the vital characteristics in the practice of number of modern Indian artists uh, who, if not necessarily all, were charged by political uh, capitalism and activism. Uh, there is a huge trajectory of uh, German expressionist influence or reception in India, even before Indian independence. As you know, India was a colonial country. We got independence in 1947. But German expressionism was uh, I mean, the reception was already there in 20s with the uh, arrival of first international exhibition in India was Bauhaus exhibition. And after that, uh, there are a lot of tendencies were uh, received by Indian artists. And, uh, but I will not speak about that part. I will speak post-independence 70s and late 80s and after that. So yeah, so this presentation attempts to excavate specific locations which have shaped these aesthetic choices, integral and coincidental to emerging social concerns. In a way, the research try, tries to understand the conscious conveying of emotions explored by the artist who draw upon expressionist impulses and reconfigured expressivity, uh, also called expressionist staging, is the term which is used by Ulrike Gershen uh, in one of the articles. So it is about emotional, you know, there is a necessity, emotional, con there are conditions where emotions are supposed to be used. So, yeah, so in the understanding of Indian artists, the domains of imagination were more sharply distinguished according to their specific concerns, and many times these specific concerns would not engage with each other. Therefore, the understanding of human condition by Indian artists was constitutionally fragmented uh, along the lines of caste, cra uh, caste class, and gender. So, uh, in expressionist tendencies have often associated with the male artist. I mean, usually it is a very male-oriented uh, language. That's what it was being critiqued. Uh, so, due to the rendering of a specific emotion, bold brush strokes, distortion of forms, colors, etc., going against the rigid definition, I have started looking at the works of Indian women artists who have used expressionist idioms in their works, the women, uh, the women movement of late 70s and 80s stood against the patriarchal structure of nation state, I'm talking about India, being a heterogeneous societal structure of Indian society, unlike the Western society, West feminism was combat combating the many invisible forms of patriarchy and dominance in India. The uh, rendering of ex expressionism has worked out to show apathy towards the violence during the time of the partition in India in 1947, and in that time also against the colonial rule. A lot of artists used this language. Uh, so as I told you, there is trajectory of, in, of expressionism in India. It started with Bauhaus exhibition, and after that, there was exhibition which traveled to India called German Expressionist Paintings. Sorry. So, uh, and there was another exhibition which was curated by the uh, well-known curator of the uh, state-owned National, uh, National Gallery of Modern Art. And the name of that exhibition was Indian Expressionist Artist. Okay? So, uh, yeah, so women artists. So Gogi Sorosh Pal is one of the most interesting female artists. She explores the essence of feminine which excavates the core of Indianness in art 
trying to discover permeable art forms from the visual textual traditions. Critique says that while her contemporaries were examining, imitating, and deriving sources and the images from the Western tradition, or trying to locate their identity in the alternative to Western art, Gogi Saroshpal looked for visual expression only within her cultural milieu and tradition. But I would like to argue that her works have a streak of expressionism. Her works, early works, her works are very playful and at the same time carries emotion laden with her own sensibilities. The iconicity of female subject in the works of Gogi Soroshpal is a synthesis of partly her own experiences, uh, her own experiences, societal sufferings of women, and partly because she draws many icons from mythology whose gender roles have always remained an ambiguous and objective and mystery in the eyes of patriarchal society in India. It has been observed that Gogi Soroshpal was not content with the depiction of Hindu gods and goddesses, like we have Hindu gods and goddesses, uh, like Ganesha, Durga, Mahisasur, Mardini, uh, but but instead of that, she, uh, she evoked the images which are uh, alternative to, uh, the, you know, uh, to Ganesha and Durga. These are also mythological images like subjects uh, like Kinnari, Kamdhenu, uh, Naika, Shwambaram. These are the mythological uh, uh, images which she uses. You know, she is this, this, this kind of image. So it's a mythological image, you know, but she is using in a very different way. Uh, so she is delving deeper to depths of the oral and canonical literary and artistic sources to recover such embod embodiments of feminine. Why should one see Indian symbols such as Kinnari, Kamdhenu, Kali? This is Kali, God, goddess, is Ka goddess Kali. So Gog, uh, Gogi works as expression. I mean, why she uses this subject and she try to you know uh, try to. Uh, incorporate into the expressionist language. In India, expressionism has been already prevalent style. You know, it was already a style which was there. So Gogi has created a new iconography as a reference to the contemporary times in which she found creative visual symbols that bridged the gaps in the continuity of our cultural identity. In her search for those symbols, she surveyed the archaic monuments and culture, cultural heritage. Uh, she rendering the, she is rendering bold colors, sharp emotive faciality, symbolism, elongated limbs are markers of execution of expressionist attitude. The figure is often archaing, arch, sorry, sorry, archaing stretching, sometimes nude figure reminiscent, reminiscent of boldness and depth, which expressionists such as Krishna, Rotloff, and Haeckel had rendered in their figures. So this is part of the Being Women series. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So this is a human landscape. Melancholic Naika. Naika means actress, uh, and the painting also called Dream Boats. Uh, so there is a reference to Edward Munch. Look at the background. Her work, such as Being Women series, are fine illustration of expressionist tendencies. There is a possibility to contrast her work with expressionists who were dealing with the themes of social sufferings and the evils of instrumental society embodied. The painting of the Women series are full of deep emotional and female, female evocations, which indicate a place of women in society. She locates the trauma and stigma of what women experience in everyday life, especially in uh, semi-feudal and patriarchal Indian society. Contrary to the conventional way of depicting women as a more feminine, Gogi's women in this painting appear to be ugly, grotesque, and this quality is only evoked by her use of expressionist language. So there are some other art, women artists also in India. I'm not going to uh, I mean, discuss in detail about this work, but I just want to tell you there are other women artists also, those who work with this kind of languages. So now uh, there is uh, another set of artists, I mean the group, artist group, art collective, uh, the realist and the radicals. So the realists, they are from the eastern part of India, near Calcutta, and radical painter, they are from Kerala, the southern part of India. So there is an emergence of two distinct art collectives from Shanti Niketan. Shanti Niketan is an art school, uh, very popular, very well-known art school. Uh, uh, it's uh, and, and Rabindranath Tagore. He he comes from. If you heard of Rabindranath Tagore, uh, Nobel literate, he he comes from this uh, this place, and he is the one who uh, who uh, started this uh, Shanti Niketan. So uh, so two groups I'm going to discuss. One is realist and the radical painters and sculptors association. That 
almost ran parallel to each other in the 80s. These are two art collectives saw convergence at first in their understanding of society through Marxist perspective. The idea of proletariat was critical. Pro proletariat was critical. And secondly, in terms of their choice of representing the life world of everyday, more specifically peasant, worker, common man, etc., inherent in their art practice was a vigorous critique of mainstream art practices, which they marked out as conception of elite, elite nearly for the purposes of consumption. So they are categorizing other arts as elite. My interest in emergence of these two art collectives is from the point of view of their harnessing of expressionist idioms to convey their critique and register their protest through their art. Fundamental to their critique was the idea that narrative underlying the various stages of art movements or art historical developments in India beginning from revivalism. So there are various, uh, I mean, various, uh, uh, what you call, uh, stages of you know development of, uh, of 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 art historical developments in india so they are critiquing all the, all those developments through using by using this language the realists were inspired by epithet of social realism but in actuality these are expressionist tendency which they rendered in their works the realist stage staged expressivity in a similar way by which the expressionists realized the potential of strong and bold artistic language to appeal the masses folk a comp the, that comprised of industrial workers, peasants, laborers, proletariats from all walks of life. The similarities are noticeable even in the prints of the, real, the realist, especially in the works of Suranjan Basu. Approach to the themes of humanity remains reminiscent of Kathy Kolovitz and, and Ernst Berlach's works. For instance, uh, the works such as Beggar Family, uh, Grief, Winter are quite closer to the themes of humanitarian expressionist. So this is... So this is Hans Berlach, and you can see this. So there is a certain kind of expressivity. I'm using the term expressivity is invoked by is invoked by Suranjan Basu in the sculpture called Winter, uh, which is very uh, very closer to uh, Hans Berlach's Shivering Crone. So Barlak and Kolovitz were quite central to the expressionist debates of Soviet bloc, and their art was officially acceptable in GDR. GDR. So dealing with the idea of poverty and despair among the street dwellers, the writings of Bertolt Brecht address the specific features of. So there is a huge discourse about that. I'm not again going into detail. Uh, so next slide. Often the airy image of state terror and state repression has been invoked in the works of the realists. The paintings like Disappointment of War by Prabir Biswas is very apparently rendered by expressionist style. The painting equals the use of expressionist vocabularies, which is very similar to Otto Dick's work called The Self-Portrait of Soldier. It seems that the image of soldier is recontextualized in Biswas' works. In fact, Indian nation state experienced the ramification of war in the period of 70s in India uh, uh, in, in, in the form of number of upheavals such as Indo-Pakistan War, India-Pakistan War, con con Concurring with the Nexalite insurgency, Nexalite movement, ultra left movement, the reaction was, reaction, the reaction as well as a contempt of war and violence was very strong among the intellectuals who pursuing the tenets of third world Marxism and non-aligned movement in order to restore egalitarian values. There was an active voice against disarmament and militarization that struck the artist, whether Bangladesh liberation war, Vietnam war, or reality of war generated political views, contestation. This resulted into, the, into a proliferation of images through which uh, various media, particularly newspapers and magazines, they reproduce images. The emergence of radical painters and sculptors association, the other group from Kerala, from the South India, coincide with the realist, despite being regionally distinct. These two groups are regionally distinct, uh, but both of them, both of these art collectives are adhered to the Marxist ideology and shared an, uh, shared an agenda to take up their art to the common masses. Expressionist staging, Expressionist staging and ex attributes of expressivity are very evident in the works of radical artists. Most of the radical artists were drawn to the nationalite movement, which is ultra-left movement, in the period of seven late 70s and 80s. A large number of youth was very critical of conservative official Marxism in the period, influenced by extreme left position. Uh, so there is a person, uh, K.M. Madhusudan, who is a founding member of this radical group, he says, I quote, 
German expressionism, I interviewed him and he explained to me. So I quote him, uh, I quote, German expressionism had a hugely insignificant influence over a majority of artists from third world. This might be because this movement arose in the context of war. In countries that haven't seen war, perhaps German expressionism would not be remembered. During my college days, I have always closely studied paintings of Beckman, Krishna, among many, not just paintings, breast plates, Poetry have influenced me deeply. Even today, I carry those memories. So, a quote close. So, there is another art uh, culture theorist and uh, art critic in India, Ashish Shraddha Daksha, who closely associated with the radical artist group, the group which I'm just talking about. Uh, so, uh, he articulates that several Kerala artists, I mean the artists from the radical group, invoking variety of expressionist movement. Variety of expressionist movement, this invocation to me suggests that there are two variants of expressionism. So sometime, you know, artists were not, were not, they were not informed about expressionism, historical expressionism and new expressionism, and they tried to mix both together. So it is possible that radicals may have looked at the works of German new expressionists, particularly the works of George Baselitz and Eugene Schoenbeck, who were the early proponents of new expressionism. Some of the works of Krishna Kumar, KP Krishna Kumar, artist, are very are quite similar to the George Baselitz and Eugene, uh, Eugene Schoenbeck, if not necessarily in terms of style, but more in the terms of their using the tremendous energies and their radical attitude. If we analyze Krishna Kumar's sculpture, Young Man, with the Baselitz painting, Big Night Down the Drain, and to some extent, shown a back in which one see a number of striking parallels on conceptual level, Krishna Kumar's three-dimensional work is quite similar to uh, Baselitz's work. So I just cut short. I come, uh, you have time? I have time? Two minutes, okay. <laughs> so yeah. So I just want to talk about this and uh, so uh, this is called Dalit Art and Expressionism, Service of Worker. So uh, I would like to discuss newly emerged category, which is called Dalit Aesthetics. What is Dalit Aesthetics? It's come from this. I'm, uh, just uh, you read it and you figure out. So <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> because I have less time, so yeah. So Dalits are uh, marginalized, untouchable. Uh, the, I mean, they're supposed to be untouchable and marginalized people. So he belonged to that community, the Sabisa worker. Uh, so what he does, uh, so there is categories of caste in India, if you know. I mean, there is a top, upper, I mean, upper caste, Brahmins, and then Dalits who are below, which are untouchable, you know. So they are the markers of unpurity. So they have... There is a stigma in society. So this artist uh, uses this kind of image. It's the art of service worker is the embodiment of such aesthetic choice in which he utilizes expressionist vocabulary to depict the harsh facets of the Dalit life world, the marginalized art life world, to register the protest against the caste-based social hierarchy imposed by the dominant belief system. So he is carrying that cow because that was their work, the lineal work which they're supposed to do. They're not supposed to do the higher works. They're supposed to be, you know, in lineal work. Uh, and he, I mean, like this. So they have to, you know, carry all these things. So he's using this kind of images. Uh, okay, like this because these are untouchable couple. So they are not allowed to go everywhere. They have they have boundaries. And they even can't spit anywhere. So there is a kind of a, you know, a pot is being hung on there. Uh, and the symbols of Hinduism, because it's a Hindu religion which made them uh, untouchable. So it's a kind of a subversion, it kind of kind of a protest against uh, you know, that kind of you know, marker. So uh, I just want to conclude without, I mean, I would not say anything, just I want to show you some images. I just want to read out, I mean, uh, uh, expressionism, which began with exhibition, okay. So, yes, yeah, so this is my conclusion. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, 
So in my view, the reception of expressionism in India cannot be understood when one traces various shifts in regard to expressionism within Europe, where expressionism is reflecting the changes in war ridden societies and opposing the consequent industrialization, rationalization of everyday life. Amongst many art movements, expressionism was a path-breaking movement which was fundamentally developing a voice of protest against existing social ills and upheavals. Therefore, the thrust is to grasp the trace of Western provenance of expressionist idiom vis-a-vis -vis implications on <laughs> non-Western countries, which are equally critical. So, and expressionism is very entrenched. These are the posters where I come from, where I studied in Jawaharlal Nehru University. So in the political posters, you often find such images, you know, uh, not now, but 10 years earlier when I was a student. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so you can see Kathy Kolovitz. I mean, there is a, I mean, it's a protest. I mean, political, it's a, these are, you can say propaganda or agenda, or whatever. So, yeah. This is from Metropolis. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your tour de force through expressionist <laughs> tendencies in Indian contemporary art. And maybe we could use your, put your slides up, or basically, if you're willing to share your slides, I mean, some people might be interested to actually go back and look at some of the images. Sure, 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 sure. So we could then maybe manage this through the museum. Uh, but I think that it might actually be quite handy and welcome for some of your colleagues. The floor is open for questions. Well, first of all, thank you. That was really interesting. I have a question to the reception of Amrita Shergil in Amrita Shergil in India, because she was of Indian. But there's nothing to do with expressionism. <laughs> nothing to do with She was influenced by Paul Gauguin, so. By? by Paul Gauguin. That's why I yeah, think. You can ask, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that. Mm. Because, uh, yeah, but uh, that was before independence. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm asking about the reception of her. Yes. If that plays a role in your research, or maybe not? No, not at all. Okay, sorry. <laughs> More attempts at the reception? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, with, with the German expressionists, uh, whom, whom you mentioned as sort of frames of reference, th the idea of authenticity and originality mm. plays a major role. Mm. Um, and what I found intriguing is that um, it seems that these, some of the artists you, uh, you introduced uh, uh, don't mind um, using these references. Yes. So they're, you know, kind of that seems to be um, a, a, a major change from the kind of modernist focus on originality versus the sort of perhaps postmodern 1980s, 1990s attitude of, of using these reference frames and, and drawing on them. I wonder whether you, you could say something about that, kind of the idea of originality. Huh, yes, uh, this is, uh, I mean, there are critiques, you know, when I was presenting my work, then a lot of people asked me, am I, I mean, colleagues, you know, uh, because in, in, there is a kind of, a, in post-colonial, because it's a post-colonial situation, uh, there is a kind of a, a term which is used, which was framed by, you know, Partha Chatterjee, Partha Chatterjee, he, this derivative discourse, derivative discourse. So, uh, so what is, I mean, we, I mean, the post-colonial artists are uh, charged with the slavish mentality especially by W.G. Archer. W.G. Archer was a critic who was there in India, who worked with the British, uh, I mean, British establishment, and he uh, wrote about Indian art, not only modern art, but other kinds of art, tra traditional art. So he says that Indian artists have a kind of a slavish mentality to emulate. But later on, you know, some artists, they, uh, Go, go on, they gone against that and said, yeah, we, what's the point, I mean, what's the harm using the uh, European language uh, if it suits to us? 
if it's true to the message which we would like to convey to the public. I mean, the idea of protest, the idea of uh, 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 subversion, you know. So they were freely using this language. And I quoted one of the artists. He says, yeah, I'll, we learned so much from German expressionism. I and mean, I can give you 10 examples if you, I mean, if you can meet me outside, but not now. <laughs> So we have time for one more question before the lunch break. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe we can combine the questions. Um, but uh, yeah, so we don't postpone the. This was. OK. Then we have time for. Hi. You all have questions. That's very, very intriguing. But we're delayed with the schedule. And we're all eager to go to the lunch break. So maybe if you keep the questions and answers brief, we get through here first. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your great talk. It was very interesting. Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions you were mentioning. Uh, <laughs> sorry, but they were very connected. <laughs> uh, you were mentioning the um, exhibition of the Bauhaus mm -hmm. in uh, in Calcutta and further exhibitions of German art. I couldn't understand very well. Maybe you could. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. That was the first question, and very like very connected. Also, um, Rabindranath Tagore was mm -hmm. traveling in Germany yes, in the yes. 20s and 30s, and I was asking myself if, if he brought some reproductions or magazines or artworks to Shantini Ketan, who were um, who played a role also in the reception of uh, German expressionism in Shantini yeah. Ketan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Very interesting question. Uh, uh, yeah, in Rabindranath Tagore work, I mean, I have, I have an art, I mean, I, I, mean, I wrote an article and it's published, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, he, uh, lot of his works very closer to German expressionist artist, and, uh, about the collection he received from, I don't see much, but he, I mean, there are a lot of other stuff there in the archives in the Shantini Ketan, you know, which, which gives us detail about the Bauhaus. There, there were kind of connection between Bauhaus and Shantini Ketan. So that kind of stuff is there. And you know, there, is a, there was a very important person who was teaching, was well, the first art historian there, called Stella Kramrich from Austria. So she, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, prepared modules for the students in, uh, in, the, in the classroom. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Is, is there an explicit dislike um, or a, an explicit um, stance against the British colonial power in turning towards German expressionism? Yes. Um, when we look at the reluctancy to exhibit German expressionism in Great Britain for decades, um, which is only breaking up since, I don't know, the 1990s, does that have something to do with... 99. 1990s or 2000, in London, the, the first Kirchner exhibition at the Royal Academy. Um, 19, 1990s, 2000, yes. Is there, is there, does that influence the turning towards um, something from Germany um, for Indian artists, or does this not play a role? I, I haven't studied about it. I haven't seen any connection. Only, uh, the only, uh, I mean, the, the time, I mean, 1922, first international Bauhaus exhibition. That was the first international exhibition, and that is the first exhibition which gave exposure to Indian artists or Indian uh, art critics. I don't see before, uh, I mean, I, maybe I haven't studied before that, but uh, my research is after Bauhaus exhibition. I have no claim to you. Yeah. yeah, as you've all seen, this has, time has flown by. We got lots of input. We have lots of things to discuss in the breaks and over lunch and over coffee and in the evenings and tomorrow on a trip. I think it was a great start and hopefully also some of the discussions and the questions we can then also discuss in some of the workshops and come back to uh, and also kind of continue further what couldn't all be presented in the papers. I'd like to thank all the speakers again and of course also you for listening and being here the whole time.
Uh, and I look forward to the next panels.